For centuries, historians who investigated Jamestown had to rely on written accounts from the time in later historical documentation. For example, the legend of Pocahontas and John Smith was wildly romanticized through a white male Anglo-Saxon prism. Jamestown was a powerful symbolic legend, first of a new world claimed for the English Empire, then later the birth of a new nation. There was a strong motivation to enhance the legend with colonialist, patriotic, and religious fervor. But recent research, archaeological findings, and scientific documentaries have revealed shocking details and grim, actually horrific, realities of settlement life and death. Could it be possible that a foundation settlement of the American nation was rife with intrigue that included crypto-Catholicism in an anti-Catholic settlement, starvation, assassination attempts, and even killing and people-eating? Well, archaeological findings seem to indicate exactly that. Recent digs that started about 20 years ago at Jamestown have revealed shocking facts about life there. So archaeologists unearthed something stunning in structure number 191, which contained a brick and mortar oven of a kitchen. First they found skeletal remains of dogs cats, rats, and even a horse in the kitchen area. But then they found something even more shocking. The mutilated skull and severed leg of an English girl dating from about 1609. The skull and tibia bone both had numerous cutting and sawing marks on them, indicating that the body had been butchered. In addition, the back of the skull was smashed open, indicating that the skull had been bludgeoned, presumably to get at the brains, which are high in protein and eaten customarily from other butchered animals by the colonialists. The winter of 1609 was known as the starving time at Jamestown, and and uh, this was from a number of written accounts. During that time, of the about 600 total folks, only 60 people survived. Immediately next to the skull, a pottery bowl was also unearthed, indicating that all this was done at that kitchen. In fact, colonists could not have picked a worse time to try and settle in Virginia. Cores drilled from centuries old trees near Jamestown by the archaeology team show that it was in the middle of a seven year drought. The previous winter had been nearly as bad and a lot of settlers had died of starvation. So it was during this time that John Smith ventured out in search of locals willing to provide the colonists with food. When he returned, he found that about 75% of the folks that had landed already starved to death. Desperate, a lot of folks decided to try to sail back to England on the small British ship, the Discovery, but Smith, trying to keep the colony afloat, aimed one of the fort's cannons at said ship and actually killed some of the defectors. In one of America's first trials by jury, Smith was condemned to the rope necklace. And by some accounts, he even had the uh, the rope there when Captain Newport sailed into the harbor with new settlers and stopped the whole end of life thing. Apparently, if you're visiting Colorado City, Arizona, as just a random tourist, you're going to be followed by several white SUVs. Folks have reported getting a weird vibe driving through and seeing all these half-built compounds and people just staring at you creepily as you drive by. Well, I was checking the Wikipedia page. Turns out it's basically run by a cult. At least three Mormon fundamental sects are said to have been based in this area. A majority of the residents and many local officials belong to the most prominent of these groups, the Fundamental Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whose corporation also owned much of the land within and around the town until state intervention in the 2000s. Direct quote, folks. A sect of Mormonism that broke off from the main church because they were excommunicated for refusing to renounce polygamy, because apparently the mainstream Mormons abandoned the practice. And they do a lot of horrible stuff. Men are not allowed to have intercourse with their wives and the only people allowed to do so are seed bearers who essentially attack women. People have been kicked out and made homeless for simply disagreeing with the church leader. These folks have been accused of some really bad crimes we can't talk about, both in the US and in Canada. In January of 2004, local leader Warren Jeffs expelled a group of 20 men, including the mayor, and gave their wives and descendants to other men. Jeffs, now a convicted predator, stated he was acting on the orders of God, while the men expelled claimed they were being penalized for disagreeing with him. He was eventually placed on the FBI FBI most wanted list, like the top 10, and arrested on August 28th of 2006. Most of the property in the town was owned by the United Effort Plan, a real estate trust of the FLDS, for short. In 2007, the state authorities began dismantling church ownership of the land, and the church retaliated and indoctrinated their followers against the state, believing they were being targeted because of their beliefs. So the followers became further and further secluded as a result. Remaining members refused to believe the charges against Jeffs, by the way. On April 6th of 2010, law enforcement officials in a nearby county of Arizona Arizona and Washington County of Utah served five search warrants seeking records from town officers. And these warrants were served on government officials and departments, including the town manager, as well as the only fire chief, which yikes. As a result of the initial warrants, the Department of Public Safety was shut down. Down, and emergency responders were prohibited from responding to calls without the approval of county officials. 
That's a big deal. On March 20th of 2014, a jury heard a local case that ruled that the towns of Colorado City and local other cities had discriminated against locals Ronald and Ginger Cook because they weren't members of the FLDS church. They just moved there. So these folks were awarded $5.2 million for religious discrimination. They'd moved to the area in 2008, but were refused access to the utilities of the town because, well, they weren't part of the FLDS. After all that, how about a more simple ghost story to uh, cleanse the palate? One from Arkansas. So back in 1931, a railroad worker named Lewis McBride allegedly killed his supervisor from the Missouri Pacific Railroad. The foreman had fired McBride for an infraction, and some claimed that McBride had intentionally manipulated a piece of track to cause a train crash. Seeking revenge for being fired, McBride killed his former boss by um, bludgeoning him with a railroad spike. Authorities arrested him, and uh, he went the way of electrocution. So not long after McBride's death, a mysterious moving light began appearing along the train tracks. Far from the highway. People have witnessed it many, many times since. And even the TV show Unsolved Mysteries documented the phenomenon. Experts say that according to documentation in the local paper, which didn't give a date, but it was somewhere in 1932, there was a lot of reports of people seeing a light on the track. The story was that when they found one person, he had a lantern in his hand, and uh, yeah, he got chased, and that was the end of his life. So the light, nowadays seen only at night, has been described as either a yellow, red, blue, or white glowing light. You would see this tiny, tiny light, said Bob Thompson, the local historic association president. What we saw was kind of a reddish golden light. Looked like someone had a baseball cap with a flashlight in it. Now Thompson said most of the time they would see the light and then would later vanish, but some folks have had more aggressive encounters. So what will scare you though is when it gets the size of a baseball cap and sometimes you can see it swinging. Now it's not just coming at you, it's moving. And then pff, it disappears. So you say, well, I did that, fine, let's go back to the car. So you turn around and then it's behind you. And that's when you get scared. It's always in a place when there is no electricity around. It shows when it chooses to show up. And when it chooses for you to see it, you see it. Though there are some scientific theories to explain the occurrence, a lot of local legends attribute the light to the ghost of McBride or of that of a different rail worker who lost their head in an accident and allegedly continues to search for his head. The tropical waters around Bermuda may feel like the opposite of Alaska's frigid wilderness, but both places have something in common. Unexplained disappearances. Thousands of tourists, residents, hikers, and airplanes have vanished without a trace in a large area of land called the Alaskan Triangle, encompassed by Juneau, Barrow, and Anchorage. So in 2007, state troopers reported about 2,833 disappearances. For a state with a population of more than 700,000 people, this suggests about one in a couple hundred people disappeared, which that's a lot of people. So yes, there are many, 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 many theories about this creepy phenomenon, some of which involve Alaska's unpredictable and often unforgiving environment, as well as, you know, the sheer expanse of the landscape that can result in many lost travelers. According to local legends, the missing people likely fell victim to the Kushtaka, a race of shape-shifting otter people who lure humans away from civilization and transform their captives into one of them. And finally for today, let's talk about something interesting in history. Allegedly, parts of the incident that led to the U.S. intervention in Vietnam never happened. After evading a torpedo attack, the USS Maddox reportedly engaged three North Vietnamese boats in the Gulf of Tonkin on both August 2nd and August 4th of 1964, according to the Pentagon Papers. Although without U.S. casualties, the events prompted Congress to pass a resolution, allowing the president to intervene in the country. So talk of this status as a false flag for the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War has permeated public discourse almost since the time of the attacks, especially after the government admitted that the second incident involved false radar images. But after resisting comment for decades, the NSA finally declassified documents in 2005, admitting the incident on August 4th never happened. Those involved didn't necessarily intend to cover up the incident to propagate a war, but the evidence does suggest an active effort to make it fit the claim of what happened, according to historians. Number 5. The Gates of Hell Coming up first on the list of cursed places today is going to be the Gates of Hell in Turkmenistan. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that that's where hell was. It's in Turkmenistan. No, don't worry, we're not being so literal. This place is not for the faint of heart, as it's said to be one of the most cursed locations on the planet. The Gates of Hell is a massive crater located in the middle of the Karakum Desert. Legend has it that this pit was created when Soviet geologists drilled into a pocket of natural gas, causing the ground beneath their rig to collapse and exposing a vast underground cavern filled with gas. The geologists then decided to set the gas on fire to prevent poisonous gas from spreading.
spreading. I'm not a scientist or a gas man or anything, but that feels like the wrong move. Because the fire has been burning for over 50 years, creating an endless and infernal pit of flames that can reach up to 30 feet high. And probably a pretty cool place to keep a music festival. According to local folklore, the fiery pit is said to be a portal to the underworld, with demonic entities and lost souls trapped within the flames. Visitors have reported feeling an overwhelming sense of dread and unease while standing near the crater, as if they're being watched by something malevolent. Some have even gone so far as to say they see shadowy figures moving in the flames. Others have heard disembodied voices and screams emanating from the pit. This also bears mentioning, and skip ahead if you're arachnophobic, but there's reports of a strange phenomenon of spiders en masse walking into the pit. They walk right into the fire and just burn right up. They're drawn to heat and light, but of course, it does also seem like it's a mass spider sacrifice, which just seems a little too satanic for me. And if that wasn't nearly enough to scare you, there are also people who claim that there are strange rituals being performed near the crater, with mysterious symbols and offerings left at the edge of the pit. I think I will stay to the edge of my house and go nowhere near them. Number 4. Huska Castle in the Czech Republic Huska Castle. Huska Castle. Huska Castle. Huska Castle. I'll say that right one time. Huska Castle. This gothic masterpiece is located in the heart of the Czech Republic and has a dark and terrifying history that will send a chill down your spine. Legend has it that Huska Castle was built in the 13th century to seal a gateway to hell that had opened up on the site. Now, they didn't pay attention, the gateway to hell is in Turkmenistan, we just covered that. According to local folklore, the castle was constructed by prisoners who were promised their freedom if they could build it without windows or doors, creating an impenetrable fortress that would keep the demons and other malevolent entities at bay. But that's not all, That's not. there's more scares coming. Huska Castle has been the site of numerous numerous supernatural occurrences, and is said to be haunted by the ghosts of its past inhabitants. Visitors have reported seeing apparitions, hearing strange noises and whispers, and feeling an overwhelming sense of dread while inside the castle's walls. One of the more unnerving legends about Huska Castle involves a bottomless pit that is said to be located beneath it. According to legend, prisoners were thrown into the pit to determine whether or not it was a gateway to hell. The screams of the doomed souls who were thrown in are said to still be heard echoing through the castle's halls. The acoustics are just great, let me tell you. Some people have reported feeling like that they're being watched by something, while others have reported feeling a cold breeze and a sense of oppression, as if something sinister is waiting. Despite this castle's haunting reputation and all these various reasons why you should never go anywhere near it, it remains a popular destination for thrill seekers and horror enthusiasts. Number 3. The Zone of Silence Up next, we're going to be talking about the Zone of Silence, which is one of the most threatening names I've heard for a place in a while. It sounds like a place where like an evil emperor would send you to be punished. And in a sense, that could be considered true. It's a place where radio signals can't be received and compasses spin uncontrollably. Some people even say that time passes differently there. What is happening? Located in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert, the Zone of Silence is the nickname given to a mysterious patch of desert with strange properties. Legends say that the zone was born out of the site of a meteorite crash in the 70s, which caused a nuclear-like explosion. Since then, it's become a hot spot for all manner of paranormal mystery. Lights in the sky, unexplained disappearances, and a whole lot more. Now, There's all kinds of conspiracies and speculation about what happens here. But one of the more interesting ones that stood out to me has got to be the legend of a group of cryptids called the Silent Ones. These creatures are said to be humanoid with elongated limbs and featureless faces, and they emit a deafening silence. Those who are brave enough to venture forth into the zone of silence say that they feel as if they're being watched by something there. Is it the Silent Ones? Aliens? Government surveillance? All I know is I'm not going anywhere near a place called the Zone of Silence to check. I'll stay in my zone of noise. Thank you very much. Number 2. Lake Natron Our next entry is Lake Natron in Tanzania. It's instantly recognizable because the lake does not look at all like the kind of lake you'd want to go for a dip in. The scarlet red water is a sight to behold. But if you believe the legends surrounding the lake, the water is also said to be cursed by the gods themselves. And I think it has a shiny Gyarados in there too. Now there is a reasonable scientific explanation for why the lake looks like it would be Dracula's dream vacation spot. It's not running red from any body fluids, but rather a high concentration of salt and other minerals in the water giving it a ghastly hue. But. Like I mentioned before, local folklore says that the lake is cursed by the Maasai people who believe that the lake is home to evil spirits that prey on unsuspecting visitors. 
Here's another fun tidbit about the lake's lore. There are legends that animals that come into contact with the Crimson Lake will be instantly calcified, turning into stone statues due to the lake's incredibly dangerously high salt content. And I thought the Blizzard forums were salty. That's a little gamer joke for you. There are those who say a similar fate await humans, but so far as I know, I don't think anyone's tried. The lake is dangerous enough, what with being boiling hot as well. I don't think anyone's willing to dip a pinky toe in there just to see if it'll freeze. There's also been strange reports of strange lights and apparitions appearing around the lake, as if the spirits of the dead are rising up from its depths. Is it a gateway to the underworld? A melting pot between our world and theirs? And does red water taste differently? I feel like it might have like, I don't know, maybe a raspberry or strawberry flavor. I'm not really willing to try, but let me know any out there if anyone has. And number one, snake. Island. Our final entry today is going to be the Isla de Quimara Grande, which is formerly dubbed as Snake Island, which really should tell you everything you need to know about this place. You cannot expect this to be welcoming. Traditionally, when places are named things like Snake Island, they're usually filled to bursting with snakes or they're like home to a snake themed supervillain or something. I'm pretty sure the guys who fought G.I. Joe lived on Snake Island. Well, Snake Island earned its name because, guess this, by conservative estimates, there's roughly a snake for every square meter. Estimates suggest there's anything from 4,000 golden lancehead vipers or more living there. There's more snakes than there are people on this island because most Brazilian locals know far better than to go to an island where one of the most venomous snakes in the world live. Yeah, I left that part out. I'm gonna slide that under the door right now, buried the lead a little bit. It's not just like garter snakes slithering about here. No, 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 no. Isla de Quimara Grande is home to the Golden Lancehead, a beautiful creature in its own right, but one of the most lethal snakes on the planet. A bite from this snake can cause kidney damage, necrosis, brain hemorrhaging, venom poisoning, and internal intestinal damage. So yeah, maybe just leave them alone. Maybe. <laughs> Even if for some bizarre reason you just absolutely love going to places you're not meant to and you are just dying for a chance to go visit Toxic Snake Island, you're going to run into a bit of trouble because it is quite literally forbidden. The Brazilian government strictly monitors those who travel to the island. Naval forces visit annually to maintain the lighthouse and there is a small research station to study and analyze the local population. But all of these visits are accompanied by paramedics and trained doctors just in case any of the locals decide to say hello the only way they know how. And in a weird, weird aside, am I the only one who thinks the golden lance head is kind of cute in a weird way? I don't know. I kind of like snakes. I don't think I'd want one as a pet, but I don't know. These little danger noodles, they have very cute little eyes and adorable little beady things that I know would do unspeakable things to my body if I ever touched one. Number five, Himuro Mansion. Up first on this list of haunting places in Japan is Himuro Mansion, an oft-repeated folk tale and Japanese urban legend that's told with a hushed whisper. It's one of the more famous urban legends of Japan and actually ended up inspiring the Fatal Frame series of horror video games if you're a fan of those. The legend goes that the mansion once belonged to a wealthy and influential family. Noble and well-respected, people would speak of rumors of the family involvement in the occult and their practice of sinister rituals. The most notorious one was known as the strangling ritual, which was performed every half century to prevent an ages old dark curse that would engulf the mansion and its inhabitants and spill out into the surrounding lands. This ritual involved selecting a young noble girl from a prestigious lineage. She was then known as the Rope Maiden, and I know what that name sounds like, but it's not for good reasons, trust me. The Rope Maiden on the day of the ritual would be tied and bound to four horses and I promise you don't want to know what comes next, but you can probably imagine. The story goes that when it came time for the last ritual, the maiden was smitten with a member of the family who wanted to run away with her. The patriarch of the family raised his blade to the maiden and then on his own family, and finally himself. Himuro Mansion was abandoned and lost to time. Whether or not it still stands is even a dispute. The legends say that if you find Himuro Mansion and you take photos at it, you'll see the ghosts of all the rope maidens of past. This 
legend is what directly inspired the Fatal Frame series of horror video games, which all revolve around using a camera to take pictures of ghosts in abandoned mansions. So you can see where that idea turned into the final project. They're one of the most terrifying games I've ever played, and if you've never played one, I definitely recommend, especially if you're a fan of Japanese urban legends. And I assume you are, so why you're watching this video. But if you're looking for more Japanese urban legends, or heck, any urban legend around the globe, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. In fact, if you can think it up, we've probably done a video or two or three on it. So hit subscribe, please make sure you hit that bell as well, and would you kindly do that at the end of this video, because I got four more scary Japanese urban legends coming for you right now. Number four, Hirosaki Castle. Coming up next on our list of hot spots to avoid is Hirosaki Castle. It's located in Aomori Prefecture, and it has a history steeped in darkness and ghostly legends. This beautiful castle, surrounded by cherry blossom trees, holds secrets that whisper through its corridors and send shivers down the spines of those who dare to explore. The legends say that Hirosaki Castle is haunted by the tormented spirit of a young maid named Oshichi. In the feudal era, Oshichi served as a maid in the castle's quarters, where she fell deeply in love with a samurai. However, this forbidden love was discovered and Oshichi's lover was punished and executed for the simple crime of love. Consumed by grief and longing, Oshichi's heart turned to darkness. On the night he was to be executed, she set the castle ablaze. She had such a lust for revenge. Who perished in that castle? Countless lives burned away that day, trapped in the inferno she caused. Tragically, Oshichi herself would be lost to the flame as well, as the castle burned to the ground. Since then, the spirit of Oshichi is said to haunt Hirosaki Castle, seeking solace and eternal reunion with her lost love. Visitors have reported encountering her ghostly figure, a pale and ethereal apparition clad in tattered robes wandering the castle's grounds. Her mournful wails piercing the silence of the night, echoing the empty halls, leaving those who hear it trembling with fear. Now souls far braver than I have ventured into the castle's depths and have experienced chilling things. Sounds of footsteps that appear to be coming from nowhere but following them, a cold gust of wind that tickles the back of their necks, and an overwhelming feeling of being unwatched by unseen eyes, shadowy figures flickering in the corner of your vision. Some visitors have even claimed to witness the sight of flames dancing in empty rooms, a ghostly reminder of the tragedy that unfolded centuries ago. I'm certainly not brave enough to visit Hirosaki Castle, but if you are, definitely check it out. I just recommend you know exactly where the fire exits are before you go. Go, just in case. If it happened once, it might happen again. That's all I'm saying. Number three, Himeji Castle and Okiku's Well. Himeji Castle. It's a majestic fortress located in Himeji City. Despite the castle's outward beauty, it hides a dark legend centered around a cursed well, so infamous that it's inspired countless folk tales and the iconic Japanese horror classic, Ringu. The legend revolves around a girl named Okiku, who served in Himeji Castle during the feudal era. Okiku possessed a great beauty and caught the attention of a samurai lord. She rejected his advances due to her loyalty to another samurai. Enraged by this rejection, the lord framed Okiku for a crime and accused her of stealing one of ten precious family heirloom plates. Okiku knew she was innocent, and thus she refused to confess to the crime. The lord was a sadist and treated Okiku with cruel impunity. He tormented her, subjecting her to unspeakable acts, things better left said in polite company like my YouTube friends. Determined to get her to confess to this false crime, he cast her into a well, where she would fall to her death. This well is now known as Okiku's Well, and it's become a place of dread and sorrow. Do not drink anything that comes out of this thing, because it's said that Okiku's ghost emerges from the well, counting the plates repeatedly in a desperate attempt to prove her innocence and seek justice. Now, legend has it that if the count reaches nine, a terrible curse will befall Himeji Castle and all the inhabitants. Now, if this sounds kind of familiar, and maybe because it's I mentioned that it's the inspiration for Ringu earlier in this point, this was the inspiration for the iconic Japanese horror film franchise. A cursed videotape haunts anyone who watches it, leading to their gruesome demise in seven days. The film's ghost, Sadako, or Samara Morgan if you're American, shares similarities with Okiku, including her ghostly emergence from a well and a vengeful desire to seek justice. And you know what? I bet both Okiku and Sadako are actually real sweethearts if you just sit down and get to know them. 
them. The well in Hemeji Castle continues to captivate visitors who report all sorts of eerie things. Disembodied whispers and overwhelming feeling of unease near the well's vicinity. Are you brave enough? I honestly would not even dare. And also, I gotta work in seven days, so I can't be watching any haunted videotapes. Number two, Inanaki Island. Deep within the mist-shrouded mountains of Japan lies a place that chills the souls who dare speak its name, Inanaki Village. This cursed and forsaken village holds a dark legend that scares even the bravest paranormal enthusiasts. According to the folklore, Inanaki Village was once a thriving community, but a series of horrific events would lead to its downfall. The villagers were driven to madness by an unknown force, descended into depravity, practicing dark rituals and unspeakable acts of cruelty. You gotta sub to the Patreon if you wanna hear about all the unspeakable acts, all the stuff that's too unspeakable for YouTube. Their actions attracted the attention of malevolent spirits, which descended upon the village, claiming the lives of everyone. Since that fateful day, Inanaki Village has been enveloped in eternal darkness. The streets run rampant with poltergeists and all manner of spiritual prankster. Legend has it that those who are daring enough to venture into the village are forever trapped, doomed to be tormented by the rest restless souls and eventually join the legion back there. Whispers of the village's legends echo through the forest, warning travelers of the malevolence inside. The air is thick with an otherworldly presence, and the sounds of disembodied voices fill the night. Witnesses claim to have seen shadowy figures lurking among the dilapidated houses, their eyes filled with anger. It's said to be a place where time stands still, macabre secrets locked away from the world. Now those who have entered its boundaries report all the these things like sudden drops in temperature, a feeling of being watched, scratches appearing on their bodies. The anguished cries of the torment souls who met their gruesome fate reverberate through the darkness. Inanaki Village stands as a reminder of the depths of human darkness and the consequences that follow, and it serves as a warning for those who hear its name. I personally probably wouldn't go, but I recommend you might, and hey, if nobody's living there except ghosts, I'm willing to bet you can probably get an amazing deal on a one bedroom there. Might be worth looking into investing. Number one, Hashima Island. And finally, we've come to our conclusion with Japan's Hashima Island, which is commonly known as Gunkanjima Battleship Island. It's a small abandoned island located approximately 15 kilometers off the coast of Nagasaki. The island's most distinctive feature that you'll recognize is that it looks like a battleship, hence the nickname Battleship Island. It's not just because they love the Milton Bradley company over there. Hashima Island was once a thriving coal mining community during Japan's industrialization period. In the early 20th century, Mitsubishi developed the island to extract coal from the island's rich undersea mines. As the demand for coal increased, the population on the island grew as well. To accommodate this growing workforce, high-rise apartment buildings were constructed, making this island one of the most densely populated places in the world at the time. Imagine how bad the rent was here. Now, eventually the island got just too saturated in the 50s. With the decline of coal mining in the 70s, the island's viability decreased and Mitsubishi shut down the mines. The inhabitants left, with nothing left on the island but dust and echoes. Hashima Island still perseveres on. Decaying buildings, rotting concrete, dilapidated roads, decrepit remains of what used to be a bustling community. Do I have another synonym for rotting? Not sure, but if you've got a thesaurus handy, leave one in the comments. The remnants of daily life have been left untouched, leaving behind a very ghostly atmosphere that evokes feelings of stuff like Chernobyl. Now, access to most of the island is very prohibited. The place is deteriorating fast, and local government worries that, you know, any unsupervised intrusion will cause future damage. So there are some incredibly limited guided tours for those looking to wander amidst the memories. And Hashima Island definitely has an appeal to it. It's captured the interest of photographers, filmmakers, all sort of drawn to that post-apocalyptic look. And it serves as a nice poignant reminder of the rapid industrialization and subsequent decline that characterized Japan's history and the human stories that unfolded within its concrete walls. And what's scarier than thinking about how industrialization and the capitalist machine will eventually kill all of us? Nothing, except maybe like a ghost. A ghost is pretty scary. Number five on this list is the Beechworth Lunatic Asylum. Located in Australia, this is one of the most haunted asylums in the entire world. Thrillist says, formerly the Mayday Hills Lunatic Asylum, now La Trobe University's scenic Beechworth campus, this place saw 128 years of terror before closing in 1995. Apparently 9,000 patients died here over the years and people were so fast and loose with the term lunatic that few patients ever left the premises alive. 
It comes as no surprise that a few people lingered after death. Faces floating in windows are a common sight, along with Matron Sharp doing her rounds and children laughing. Tommy Kennedy, who used to transport the dead out of the asylum and died there himself, still hangs around. There's also a woman who was thrown out of a window and died in front of the hospital because she was Jewish and the only person allowed to move her, a rabbi, couldn't make it to Beechworth sooner. Yeah, so clearly this place has seen its fair share of trauma throughout the years, folks. 9,000 people is a lot of people who have died. Like, we're talking about a small town's worth of human beings who died at this freaking asylum. And as exampled by that poor Jewish woman, these deaths weren't all from natural causes either. There were said to be some sick workers here. People who were twisted and got off on hurting others. People who worked at the asylum but probably would have been better suited to be in it themselves. Asylums in general are already susceptible to haunting considering what's going on, but when you have this amount of death and atrocities take place, it just makes it that much easier for ghosts and paranormal entities to cling on. Many of the locals don't even come close to this place anymore, and a lot of the tourists who do go here thoroughly regret that decision soon afterwards. These entities are angry and want to punish those who are living for what happened way back then. I don't recommend being one of the people who gets punished. Number 4 on this list is the Gongium Psychiatric Hospital. If you had a mental illness, then I promise you this is not where you wanted to end up. Thrillist says, believed to be one of the most haunted spots in South Korea, this abandoned psych hospital could be the basis for the next Stephen King novel based on its checkered history. According to local lore, patients here began dying mysterious deaths one after the other, forcing the facility to shut down. Many believe the murderous owners of the place was to blame, claiming that he kept patients as hostages only to flee to the states when families of the deceased demanded explanations. There are also rumors of doctors going insane, rivaling their patients in madness. So literally folks, if you ended up here, then there was a pretty good chance that not only did you not get the help that you needed, but you also just died. Whether this was because of the sick owners or the doctors, who even knows? That much death has left behind its mark though, and now this place looks like a safe haven for ghosts and everything paranormal. There's also been talk of a creature that lurks here, a creature that was actually the cause of all this death to begin with and is lurking, waiting for somebody to stop by and take them next. If I was you, I wouldn't want to be that person. Number 3 on this list is the Trans Algony Lunatic Asylum. This is a scary masterpiece, folks. Thrillist says, This impressive structure, allegedly the world's second largest hand-cut stone masonry building after the Kremlin, looks like it was designed as the set of a blockbuster thriller. Built around the Civil War era, the asylum was designed to house around 250 patients, but ended up holding more than 2,400, including for a brief period, the infamous Charles Manson. That's the opposite of a celebrity endorsement. Along with severe overcrowding, profound abuse abounded people were locked in cages, lobotomized with ice picks, chained to things, and the combination led to hundreds of deaths and a palpable air of suffering. Apparitions are a plenty, like the still deranged patient Ruth who likes to attack visitors. And since the asylum was also briefly a Civil War military base, uniformed soldier ghosts roam the halls. Thousands have claimed to hear voices telling them to get out. Civil War themed ghost tours, tours of the medical center, forensic buildings and geriatrics buildings, and zombie events and balls fully play up the twisted history on the campus grounds. Now don't get me wrong, would it be really fun to be part of a zombie event at this place? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm also not trying to get attacked by Ruth, the deranged ghost patient. Whenever people travel to a place like this, there is a risk involved. I personally am not willing to take the risk based on the history that this place has seen. Comment down below if you would. Number 2 on this list is Danfer's Lunatic Asylum. This asylum hosted a very select group, criminals. Thrillist says, part prison, part asylum, all terror. This gothic monolith opened in 1878 to house mentally unstable criminals. Thanks to the addition of the mentally handicapped, alcoholics, and plain old felons, it became so severely understaffed by the 1930s that patients' deaths were often not discovered until days later, when they were found rotting in some forgotten corner. Shock therapy and lobotomies were standard procedures. In fact, some called Danvers the birthplace of the prefrontal lobotomy. But a large cemetery on site said to be haunted by evil spirits suggests these were not always successful. The sinister castle-like building is said to have inspired H.P. Lovecraft's Arkham Sanitarium and so also Batman's Arkham Asylum and was the setting of demon movie Session 9. 
And as if that weren't enough, Danvers used to be Salem Village. Yeah, of Salem Witch Trials fame. Regular ghosts are one thing, witch ghosts are another one altogether. Think about how few people would have had to work here where a literal patient would die and wouldn't be discovered until days later. And also think about what that would have meant for the actual patients. That means that even if you were still alive, you probably wouldn't be treated or seen by a professional for days at a time. Which also means that you might not eat for days at a time either and be stuck in what I can only assume would have been a cell by yourself for that entire time. This would have been a horrible place to go, even if it was just for criminals. Because of all of this, it is now deeply haunted and a place I highly recommend avoiding. And number one, Paveglia. This list has not been pleasant. I guess I should have expected that given the tone of all of these wretched, horrible, and haunted places. So let's close this list off and find somewhere nice and sunny to get away from all of life's woes. Maybe somewhere nice like, I don't know, Italy? Maybe somewhere off the coast of Venice like the island of Paveglia? Now, Paveglia is an infamous island in Italian history. It once served as a quarantine zone and final resting place for victims of the Black Plague. You know, that one. As the plague ravaged Europe and paranoia set in across the lands, it was said that anyone who showed so much as a symptom, you know, if you had a runny nose, they shipped you off to Paveglia to live out the rest of your days. Oftentimes, they would send people who weren't even really sick. You know, you just complain about a headache trying to get a day off work and you're on a long boat to the last island you're ever going to go to. It's said that over 50% of the island's soil is made of burned human ash. Let that set in for a second. The ground itself is haunted. In the early 19th century, the island converted from a quarantine zone to a mental asylum because I guess it thought that that wasn't scary enough. The asylum did not do much to improve Paveglia's reputation. Instead of being home to the sick, now it was home to droves of mentally unwell patients being made into victims via doctor's sick experiments. Cruel doctors at the asylum would impose their patients into lobotomies with no concern for sanitation or their safety with chisels, drills, and rarely if ever using anesthetic. An old ghost story has it that the main doctor at the asylum was haunted by the spirits of his former patients and the crimes he'd committed, and it drove him to such madness that he cast himself off the bell tower of the island where they say his screams can still be heard. Now, if I told you all of that and you still want to visit, first of all, why? And second of all, you're going to need to be pretty crafty as it's totally completely forbidden. You will be pressed to the fullest extent of the law if you're caught trespassing. Not even remotely worth the risk if you ask me. At best, you get arrested. At worst, haunted for the rest of your days. And that's about all she wrote for this one, my ghouls and goblins. Thanks so much for watching. Creep on creeping on, and I'll see you in the next one, provided I'm not being possessed by a malevolent spirit. Take it easy. Number 5 on this list is Pink Place Market. This would be a really nice place to do your shopping if it wasn't so freaking haunted. Mental Floss says, As one of the most famous public markets in the country, Pike Place Market is known for a lot of things. Fresh coffee, fresher fish, and paranormal activity. The Seattle Times reported on a number of figures who supposedly walk through walls or vanish into thin air. One older gentleman named Frank apparently likes to introduce himself to the living outside of a restaurant at the Alibi Room. Various other spirits also have names like Princess Angeline, Madame Nora, and the Fat Lady Barber. At one point in the early 1900s, one section of the market was home to a mortuary. Currently operating in the basement of that space is Kell's Irish Restaurant and Pub. Its manager, Patrick McAleese, recalled some eerie instances to the Times, such as a wall mirror inexplicably shattering, only to have the shards fall into a neat pile. You think someone must be pulling your leg, he said, but then you don't see anyone. So it seems that we have a full on team of ghosts here. A small village of characters who are all moving around this mall marketplace in Seattle. Because there are so many of these paranormal entities, it makes it extremely difficult for anyone to get any shopping done without having some type of ghostly interference. You can't seem to get a good coffee here without a strong side of haunting along with it. There have been multiple attempts 
attempts to rid the area of ghosts, but it just simply won't do. No matter how many experts are brought in here to cleanse the area or to put these spirits at rest, they continue to terrorize the people here. Which is really too bad because from what I've heard, they have some really nice shops in here. Number four on this list is COS. So this is a big store in New York that has quite the haunted and terrifying history to it. Mental Floss says, New Yorkers can brush elbows with a ghost while doing some light shopping in Soho. The legend dates back to 1799 when Guliama Elmore Sons tried to elope with her fellow boarding house tenant Levi Weeks. 11 days later, her body was found at the bottom of the well in Lispinard's Meadows, which is now 129 Spring Street. Since 2014, it's been the site of a COS retail store. Levi was arrested, tried, and acquitted in the first major murder trial in America that was fully recorded by a court stenographer. His attorneys, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. But Sands Ghosts is said to roam the area, a warning to other girls who might try to run off with their lovers. Curious shoppers can still see the well in COS, just head to the back of the men's department in the basement. Okay, so I have a few questions with this one. Why, after someone was literally murdered here, do we still have this death well in this store? And also, what is a well doing in a store in the first place? Like, I get that it was the 1800s or whatever, but like, we just kept that thing as time went on. Someone literally died in that thing, and now people are wondering why there are ghosts around this place. Like, no wonder Sans Ghosts is still chilling in this area. Even she is probably wondering why this well is still here. Also, can I just make a comment about ghosts in general? I get that they want to warn us about stuff and all of that, but like, why can't they just leave us a nice note or, I don't know, sit down and have a conversation? Why do they need to freak the hell out of people and just leave people confused as to what they want? Anyways, this place is going to remain haunted for a while until someone deals with that well. I'd conduct your shopping elsewhere if I was you. Number three on this list is the Cherry Vale Mall. This is just a mall that for whatever reason has decided that it wants to be haunted. Mental Floss says, since its opening in 1973, the Cherry Vale Mall in Rockford, Illinois has been been the site of some spooky vibes. The Rock River Times noted that mall employees reported feeling watched or followed after the venue closed at night. Others have reported that certain stores would be a mess in the morning with clothing scattered or displays knocked over, even if the space was cleaned before being locked up. And on an even more unsettling note, some even claimed that bathroom doors were held shut by an unknown force. So basically for no good reason, this mall is just haunted now. Now it's either that or this mall is just regularly hit with burglary. Maybe the things are moved because people have been stealing stuff and then just don't put everything back the way that they found it when they first got there. Or, and this one's a long shot, but some people are just pranking the hell out of this mall and creating the legend of a haunting here for some reason. Like a Scooby-Doo-esque vibe where they're really trying to do something else at the mall and need people to leave it alone because they're scared. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of some reason why this mall would be haunted because there really isn't a good one. Comment down below if you guys know what could be causing this mall to be the way that it is. Number two on this list is the Diamond Center. The Diamond Center is located in Anchorage, Alaska and it's very haunted. Alaska doesn't have that many people that live there. It's the largest state in America and yet it has less than 1 million residents. Which just makes what they did with this mall so much more disrespectful. A golden rule of thumb is do not build big stuff on top of ancient Native American burial sites. Well, guess what? They built the Diamond Mall on an ancient burial ground of Native Alaskans. Sure enough, what happens when you do that? Well, some pretty bad things. This mall is almost impossible to shop in now because of this and honestly, rightfully so. You should never be building stuff on this land to begin with, but just think about how big Alaska is and how few people live there. 
Like guys, we couldn't have just moved them all a kilometer that way and built it over there. I mean, I think that you have the space for it considering you're freaking Alaska. Ghosts and spirits run rampant here and many visitors and employees have had harrowing experiences with them. Some have even reported being attacked by these spirits and been told that they have to leave. Sadly, these people don't control what the mall does and now that it's been put down, the wealthy people who own it, they don't seem to care about these ghostly appearances. And finally, number one on this list is Toys R Us. So I know that Toys R Us isn't necessarily a mall, but to a kid it certainly is. And let me tell you, if you're a child, then do not go to this specific Toys R Us. The one that I'm talking about is located in Sunnyvale, California, and it's very haunted. Mental Floss says, A haunted toy store sounds like a solid horror movie plot, but it's rumored to be a reality in Sunnyvale, California. According to Stranger Dimensions, the legend goes as such. The store was built on property that was formerly a plantation. The plantation's owner, Martin Murphy, hired a preacher named Johnny Johnson. Crazy Johnny, as the preacher was nicknamed, was in love with Murphy's daughter, Elizabeth. Unfortunately, Elizabeth was planning on marrying a lawyer, and as the story has it, Johnny was angrily chopping wood one day and fatally wounded himself by accident. His ghost reportedly wanders the land, now home to the Toys R Us, looking for Elizabeth. The usual objects coming off the shelves and footsteps have been reported, but the best anecdote was of employees once hearing a voice whisper, the Lord give and the Lord taketh away over the intercom system. Imagine hearing that over the intercom. How on earth could you ever show up to your work the next day? Like, that's it guys, I am done. I am fully out of there if that's what's coming on over the intercom. I also wanna know, what is this ghost referencing? What is he planning on giving or what's he planning on taking away? Unless he really is just citing the Lord and saying that. Toy stores are supposed to be ghost free. There isn't supposed to be some haunted menace terrorizing the people who come and work here. That isn't the case at the Sunnyvale Toys R Us. And that's why I'd be buying my toys elsewhere if I was you. In at number five, we have Batstow Village in New Jersey. Located in New Jersey, Batstow Village is a historic community centered around the Batstow Iron Works. The site was ideal for iron work because there was water for mills, abundant wood for charcoal, and naturally occurring bog iron. The well-preserved and lovingly restored village dates back to 1766. As the operation of iron work grew, so did the village. There were mills, cottages, and over three dozen structures and buildings still remain Maine, many from the early 1800s. But by mid 1800s, iron production declined due to the discovery of coal ore. As the need for iron declined, then glass making was pursued by the town, but at that point, the population already started to dwindle. When Joseph Wharton purchased the property, he primarily focused on forestry and agricultural endeavors. After Joseph Wharton passed in 1909, the property was managed by a trust. The state of New Jersey began buying the land in the 1950s. The last resident to leave the town left in 19. 36, but not before strange disappearances occurred. According to local legend and a bunch of conspiracy theorists, Ong's hat offers a portal to a different dimension. In the 1970s, a few professors from Princeton fled there after being mocked by their quantum physics theories. This is when they claimed to have discovered interdimensional travel. According to other local legends, the devil is the 13th born son of the Leeds, the first inhabitants of New Jersey. Mother Leeds gave birth to a healthy baby, who within minutes transformed into this beast. This old ghost town is said to be a hotspot for the Jersey Devil activity, and in the last 50 years there have been numerous reports and encounters with the beast in this area. Some of these encounters include strange tracks along with hearing screams just outside of the village. One sighting of the Jersey Devil comes from a group that saw the creatures crossing the street in front of them. When visiting the village, some say you can feel his presence as if he's walking right behind you. In at number 4 we have Bodie, California. Located up in the Bodie Hills in Mono County, California, near Yosemite. In 1859, four miners found a good place to look for gold in the hills near the California-Nevada border. Bodie died in a blizzard not long after, but a small mining town sprung up at their camp. The town was home to 10,000 people. Bodie was a mining camp in 1859 where people had seen gold in its hills. Eventually, it turned into a well-populated town. Though like most mining towns, it saw its peaks, its losses, and then its decline. Fast forward to 1962 and the town would be fully abandoned. Although it already showed signs of decline with dwindling 
numbers at the start of the 20th century, a series of fires forced the last remaining residents to flee the town, leaving it almost exactly as it was in the early 1900s. With the dinner tables still set, shops are still stocked with supplies and restaurants are still poised to serve long forgotten meals. Today the 110 silent buildings sit spaced out for traffic and people that aren't there. Buildings such as a barbershop, a church, a mill, a morgue and a leaning hotel are hulled up by a beam and have been left untouched for 100 years. Though it has been left abandoned for years, some of the buildings are in a crumbling state of decay, while others stand strong full of their original items but long devoid of their owners. There were also 60 saloons and thus a fair amount of danger. People were robbed and crimes occurred quite often, though the curse of Bodhi has nothing to do with the fires or the sh it started because people started taking artifacts from abandoned buildings. They'd take weather-worn shoes or pieces of glass from shattered windows. Somebody once ran off with a piano. Those items may seem like they have no value, but all objects carry equal significance in telling the story of Bodhi. Thus the curse of Bodhi emerged, if you take something from Bodhi, bad luck will come around to get you. Because of the rumor spreading of a curse, people who stole items would send them back, often including heartfelt apology letters, explaining that they didn't expect their fish to pass or their romantic life to fail from stealing from Bodhi. In at number 3 we have Tlingua in Texas. The town of Tlingua, Texas was once a bustling mining town full of life, wealth and promise. Today it's a ghost town with abandoned mine shafts, a general store, an old jail, a church and multiple ghost houses. Tlingua became of interest to local miners in the late 1800s when they discovered cinnabar, a red mercury sulphide. A man by the name of Jack Dawson discovered that mercury could be extracted from the cinnabar and by 1900 there were four mining companies in the area with a population of over 2,000 people. The Chaisos Mining Company owned the entire town of Tlingua. At one point they built a general store, a post office, a hotel, a school, a theatre and even a telephone service. Though conditions in the mine were tough, with the 7 day work week being the standard, working long days in the desert heat led many miners to lose their lives in the mines. To make matters worse, the Chaisos Mining Company even paid their workers in coupons, which could only be spent at the company owned store. The decline started started once the mines dried up, companies left and the people left with them. One of the scariest parts of the town is the church, which sits on the hill above the ghost town. One quote says, as we approach the church the door opened all by itself. Inside the church, visitors report an eerie feeling when entering the church. Moreover, several others report experiencing blackouts, blurred vision and even hallucinations while exploring the abandoned town. Researchers theorize that this is due to low frequency sound waves in the area that are able to alter people's perceptions of the things around them. and as well as disorient them. In at number 2 we have Ludlow, Colorado. Located about 12 miles north of Trinidad, Ludlow, Colorado is a ghost town known for an infamous event in 1914. A former mining camp, it was the location of the Ludlow Massacre. Beginning in 1910, the resident coal miners grew unhappy over their dangerous working conditions and began to debate a strike. By 1913, a strike had begun, much to the dismay of owner John B. Rockefeller. On April 20th, 1914, there was a massacre in Ludlow, where the Colorado National Guard and Colorado Fuel and Iron Company guards attacked miners, burning their tents to the ground. Known as the Ludlow Massacre, 25 people lost their lives. The massacre was the height of the Colorado Coalfield War, which began a year earlier in 1913. Two coal mining counties, Las Animas and Hurufano, were the centers of the conflict. The United Mine Workers of America led the strike against the Colorado Fuel and Iron, owned by Rockefeller. They were upset over the horrible working conditions. Both parties led attacks back and forth over the years. Today, the old company town of Ludlow still stands as a ghost town and the site of the tent city is also kept reserved, now under the care of the United Mine Workers of America. A monument to the deceased was also built by the union at the site. In addition, the cellar where so many innocents perished is still in place. The doorway can still be seen and the dark depths of the pit can still be viewed. Though this isn't recommended as many people who visit the abandoned ghost town report a strange feeling when looking through the doorway and even worse possible whispers around them with an unexplainable source. And finally, in in the form we have Helltown, Ohio. The abandoned town known as Helltown can be found in the Suyahoga Valley in Ohio. Thus it's an eerie deserted town known by locals to be haunted. No people live in the area anymore though there are still remnants of the lives of former residents left behind. The whole town is surrounded by hazardous roads that seemingly lead to nowhere. Locals believe this was done to confuse any wandering explorers. But the Helltown church seems to have inspired the town's ominous name. The tiny white church is in the center 
of Helltown and is central to all local theories. Some say the church was a place of worship for practicing Satanists who still lurk around the closed off roads, hoping to recruit unwelcome visitors. Others believe the town was evacuated after a chemical spill that resulted in bizarre mutations of the residents and animal population. The legend of the Peninsula Python stems from this theory. There even sits an abandoned school bus in the town with legends of its own. The story goes that the bus was carrying a group of high school students who were going to one of the ski resorts near Boston when an elderly woman flagged down the bus. She was in a panic state and explained that there was a young boy in her house who was seriously hurt. The bus driver, in an attempt to help, turned down her driveway and drove into the woods hoping to help the boy. When the bus approached the house, Satan worshippers swarmed it and sacrificed all those on board. The bus sat back there for over 30 years, standing as a warning to all who decide to venture into Helltown. A local paranormal investigator set out to research the abandoned town and to his surprise, what he discovered was truly frightening. He describes Helltown as not just truly abandoned, but is home to many spirits and hauntings. His personal experience with a ghost encounter was returning to his car to find strange people looking into his car windows. Both times the people vanished as soon as they saw him approaching the car before he had a chance to speak to them. Hello once again my frightful ghouls and goblins. I'm Taylor, your casual crib keeper, but you already knew that. And today we're going to be taking a trip around the world, exploring some of the most haunted places this beautiful blue globe has to offer. With the only trouble that most of these places are explicitly forbidden from people ever stepping foot in. For good reasons too. Let's take a tour from our chair, couch, bus seat, or wherever you are, and explore the top 5 haunted places you're prohibited from visiting. Don't worry though, we're not breaking any laws if you're just doing it through the internet. Let me know down below if there's a forbidden place you would just love to see yourself in person someday. Me personally, I honestly would like to see Chernobyl someday. I think it would be cool. All right, let's dive on in. Number five, the Castle of Good Hope. Coming up first on our list of haunted hotspots is gonna be the Castle of Good Hope in Cape Town, South Africa. It was first built in the 17th century by the Dutch East India Company, so you just know there's bad vibes there to begin with. It's the oldest colonial building in South Africa, and if you believe the local legends, it's allegedly one of the most paranormal spots in the country. The first reported paranormal sighting from the castle came from 1915, when a tall, pale, mysterious man dressed in black, he sounds familiar, whose attire didn't match the era at all, country or anything, appeared seemingly out of nowhere, walking alongside one of the castle's ramparts before vanishing as soon as he appeared. Now that's pretty weird, definitely. Not quite enough to label a place haunted, but it was a one-off incident, right? Well, in 1947, this same strange man kept appearing, making regular visits for weeks on end. He'd be jumping off the castle's walls, seemingly plummeting to his doom, only to reappear again to do it all again. I gotta be honest, he sounds kinda sick, all things considered. Sounds like he just wants to bungee jump and vibe out as a ghost. Another popular story from the castle is that of former governor, one Peter Giesbert Van Noot. Whew, you try saying that five times fast. He passed in the castle on the 23rd of April, 1728, the same day he had sentenced seven army deserters to the death sentence. The legend has it that one of these soldiers hexed him and demanded he face him and watch the execution. Van Noot was apparently a bit squeamish and refused the invitation and later that day was found dead at his desk, slumped over. And some believe his ghost still wanders the castle's halls. And there were more ghosts I couldn't even fit into this one video because there's so many hauntings from this place. I recommend you read up about it afterwards. And if you want way more videos about haunted spots, ghosts, goblins, aliens, cryptids, conspiracies, true stories, fake stories, we got all of that and then some. So click through on Top 5 Scary, find something to watch, something to fall asleep to, I don't judge. Stay subscribed, stay scared, but stay watching this video. We worked hard on it. Alright, moving on through. Number 4, the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. Now, maybe this one's a bit of an obvious pick, but our next entry is going to be the infamous Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, the real life post-apocalyptic wasteland of Pripyat. Have you ever heard the word Canopsia? Maybe not, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. I only learned this word today. But it refers to a feeling of seeing an atmosphere that you know is supposed to be populated, but isn't. And I feel like that word definitely applies to Chernobyl, or like liminal is a very good feeling too. It is kind of a liminal space, because you see all of these buildings and you can imagine a life happening there, but it's frozen in time. 
The Chernobyl blast would be enough to cover a whole video and then some. I heard there was a very good HBO series about it. And trying to cover it in under two minutes would be foolhardy. So here's the super, 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 super quick Coles Note versions. Is that a late night safety test simulating a station blackout power failure ended up starting a huge blast which eventually threw radioactive material that blew all over Pripyat and the surrounding areas causing everyone to have to pick up everything and evacuate never to return. 50,000 people used to live here and now it's a ghost town. And yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I only know that line from COD 4. All gillied up, best level in the series. That one's just for my gamers out there. Now you can actually visit Chernobyl, though they don't really recommend you do. You know, it's not a fun hotspot for tourism or anything. People who delve into the zone for recreation or to find things are called stalkers, named after the Tarkovsky movie of the same name revolving around visits to a strange zone, and not the video game Stalker where bandits raid the apocalyptic zone, although you would be forgiven for thinking that. Visiting the zone is no easy task. For one, it's recommended that you absolutely go with a guide or someone who knows the area very well and then come all the requirements. You mustn't touch anything whatsoever. No vegetation. There are wild dogs that live in Chernobyl and they're very cute, but you can't touch them at all because there could be traces of radiation in their fur. You have to wear an outfit that covers as much as possible. Big boots, you know, don't show up in your sunners and flip flops. They recommend wearing a mask too to avoid inhaling any dust or you know, any of the radioactive particles that could still be floating around in the air. Real life radiation, not half as fun as the comic books. You are very unlikely to come out of here with any web slinging superpowers. More likely you're just gonna have a bad cough and uh, you know, your family's gonna get real sad. You're asked not to enter any buildings because some are so degraded that they could collapse literally at any minute with the wrong pressure applied somewhere and then you're just another tragedy. Now I've never been, but from pictures Chernobyl genuinely seems unreal, like it's not part of the world, you know? It seems like it's something out of a movie or a video game, but it's this harrowing, soul-crushing reflection of our reality, a stark warning on the dangers of nuclear power, and a grim reminder that your life as you know it can be upended forever in but a moment. Number three, mausoleum of the first Qin Emperor, Qin Shi Huang. The tomb of former emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, is notable for many reasons. Maybe it was because in 1974, when farmers from the Shaanxi province were digging a well, they discovered hundreds upon hundreds of terracotta soldiers, complete with horses, chariots, officers, infantry, a court, I think even some bears, oh my. They discovered one of the world's greatest archaeological wonders, 2,000 terracotta soldiers in Qin Shi Huang's tomb. The tomb was built like this basically to serve as history's most impressive flex. Qin Shi Huang wanted to make it good and clear that even in death, he held more might and more power than anyone could ever imagine. You know that saying, you can't take it with you? Well, he wanted to take it with him. He wanted his own army to serve him in the afterlife. The wild part about this is we don't even know how far it goes since it still hasn't fully been uncovered even all these years later. Those thousands of terracotta soldiers might just be the first wave of guys. While he reigned, Qin Shi Huang wanted to make very sure that his tomb was a good approximation of his legacy. So thousands of laborers worked tirelessly for decades to create an emperor's tomb. They think that 700,000 laborers worked on this for 40 years. That's already unbelievable, but Qin Shi Huang only even lived to be 49. So. Good thing they got that done in time, eh? Qin Shi Huang himself is buried beneath an enormous pyramid mound that stands a good distance away from the rest of the tomb. And here's where the haunted part starts to come in. According to historians, this central tomb contains treasures and wondrous objects he attained during his life, including a flowing river of pure mercury, which doesn't really sound like the greatest idea, but back then they thought that made you immortal. Soil testing the nearby areas does have elevated levels of mercury, so that might actually be true. No one is too eager to check though, since it sounds like Qin Shi Huang kitted this place out to keep any would-be Nathan Drakes or Lara Crofts from raiding this uncharted tomb. It's said that it's got ancient ballistas and all sorts of traps, like mechanisms that'll fire arrows at potential grave robbers, and hey, that mercury vapor probably isn't doing you any favors, so don't try to breathe that in. In any case, the Chinese government has been in no rush to explore what's down there. It's best to let the sleeping dead lie, especially when the sleeping dead has thousands of personal bodyguards, and it's probably haunted, let's be real. 
Number two, Snake Island. Our next entry, Isla de Quemada Grande, is formally dubbed as Snake Island, which really should tell you right off the bat that whatever I'm about to describe is not a friendly place. Traditionally, places are only named things like Snake Island if they're like, you know, filled to bursting with snakes or if they're home to like a snake themed supervillain or something. I'm pretty sure the guys who fought G.I. Joe lived on Snake Island. Anyway. Snake Island is called that because by conservative estimates, there's roughly a snake for every square meter of the island, meaning there's anywhere from 4,000 golden lance head vipers or more living there. There's more snakes than there are people, and that's because most Brazilian locals know way better than to go to an island where one of the most venomous snakes on the planet live. Yeah, I left that part out. Well, I'm talking about it now. It's not just like garter snakes slithering about here. Isla de Quemada Grande is home to the Golden Lancehead, a beautiful creature in its own right that just happens to be one of the most lethal bites to humans. A bite from this snake can cause, let's list off some fun side effects, kidney damage, necrosis, brain hemorrhaging, venom poisoning, and oh, my favorite, internal intestinal damage. So. Just leave them alone. Even if for some bizarre reason I've told you all of that and you just love going to places you're not meant to and you're just dying for a chance to go visit Venomous Snake Island, you are going to run into a bit of trouble because it's literally forbidden. The Brazilian government strictly monitors those who travel. Naval forces do visit annually to maintain the lighthouse, and there's a research station to study and analyze the local population, but all of these visits are accompanied by paramedics and trained doctors, just in case any of the locals decide to say hello the only way they know how. Am I the only one who thinks the golden lance head is kind of cute, like in a little weird way? I don't want one as a pet, but I don't know, I think these danger noodles have very cute little eyes, but maybe that's just one of my red flags. And finally, number one on this list is the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. This is an asylum that I've talked about a few times on this channel before, which speaks to how haunted it actually is. Thrillist says, with an alleged 63,000 deaths taking place inside its walls, this place is up to its eyeballs and spirits, not surprisingly topping lists of America's most haunted spots. Originally built as a tuberculosis hospital in 1910, the building saw many die from the disease, but tales of mistreatment and dubious human experimentation trickled out, and patients left the premises in what was known as the death tunnel or body chute. Apparitions including Timmy, a boy who likes to play with rubber balls who's been caught on tape, the nurse who hanged herself in room 502, another nurse who fell from the same room's window, and scattered screams and footsteps have all been seen. 63,000 deaths. And here we were thinking that the 9,000 in the other place was bad, here's 63,000 more. Any place that has a death tunnel and a body chute, that should not be a place meant for rehabilitation and seeking help. We are talking about some sick stuff that went on here. I would get into some of the rumors associated with the human experimentation, but I honestly don't think that YouTube would let this video stay up if I did. There are a plethora of ghostly spirits that haunt this place now. Dark spirits that have lost all sense of humanity and are more demon than spirit. This is a spot that must be avoided at all costs. Number five, Isle of the Dolls. <laughs> I'm not a good Spanish speaker, man. Do you ever get creeped out when you see a baby doll lost somewhere, like on the side of the road or something? You know, a cute little plaything, caked in muck and grime, lost out in the woods? Dolls have been a staple of horror movies and stories for years, and it's easy to see why. There's always a bit of an uncanny valley thing, those lifeless eyes staring at you. Well, Imagine if you had to deal with an island of hundreds if not thousands of dolls staring at you. Do you think you'd handle that well? South of the center of Mexico City lies the infamous Isla de las Monecas, or the Island of the Dolls, and I am so sorry to my native Spanish speakers for that butchering. It received the name from the island's inhabitants, which are solely dolls. Legend goes, in the 1950s, the island was the property of one Don Julian Santana Barrera, who used to preach superstitions around and was expelled from the region, living alone on this island. One day, a young girl had drowned and was found washed up in the banks of the island. Santana claims that he heard the girl crying out, I want my doll, and discovered a washed up doll on the bank as well. He hung the doll up in a tree, and claims that since that event, he would find a doll every time he went outside. 
It became his passion or obsession, possibly more accurately. Hundreds upon hundreds of dolls lined the trees of the island, hanging from just about every inch of available space. Barrera would end up passing away on the island as well, drowning in the same spot that the girl drowned in all those years ago. Locals believe it was a curse from the girl's lingering spirit that still lays dormant on the island. Since then, the island has become a popular tourist spot for paranormal hunters. I mean, look at the place. I didn't even need to tell you a backstory for you to surmise that this is probably a haunted island. It's only accessible via a boat ride, and some guides will actually outright refuse to take you to the island of the dolls for fear of cursing. If you do go, I don't know, bring a doll, maybe. I probably couldn't hurt. Just don't take any, okay? This is one of those things where you, you take only pictures, leave only footprints, and maybe leave a haunted doll as well. And if you're looking to go on a vacation without even leaving your home, Top 5 Scary has tons of videos of cursed places, ghost sightings, aliens, cryptids, true crime, basically anything spooky you can think of, we've done a video on it. Click through the archives, stay subscribed, and stay scared, more importantly. Okay, well let's keep going. We got a whole lot more video to go. Number 4. The Waverly Hills Sanatorium The Waverly Hills Sanatorium has had a real storied history as far as a building goes. It began its life as a hospital, eventually became a nursing home, and now is considered one of the most haunted spots in the United States. Quite the resume. It first opened in Louisville, Kentucky in the year 1910 to treat new incoming tuberculosis patients. That year, a recently built hospital had moved all of their TB patients over to the sanatorium who had to put up tents to accommodate all of their new uh, guests. The sanitarium housed thousands of patients over the years before the hospital would close to convert into that nursing home in 1961. Now. The estimates may vary because there's not a lot written down, but the estimates say that as many as 64,000 people died inside the sanatorium. 64,000. That is insane. Now, if you've played Red Dead Redemption, I don't need to tell you how bad tuberculosis is. It used to be dubbed the White Plague for its high mortality rate before more advanced treatments became commonplace in curing the illness in the late 40s. So around the time of the sanatorium, it was mostly a death sentence. So is it any surprise that Waverly is said to contain lost, tormented souls unable to move forward? No, not particularly. There's an underground tunnel from the sanatorium to the bottom of the hill, which was used to transport dead patients. The tunnel is supposedly haunted by those who made their last journey through it. One of the most notable haunted spots in the building though is room 502, which is said to contain the ghost of a nurse in uniform. There's a couple different legends corresponding to this. One says that the nurse took her life jumping out of that window, and another who said the nurse took her life by hanging because she was pregnant. And neither one of those is particularly pleasant to think about as the good option. These days, if you're feeling particularly brave, the sanatorium has opened its doors once again, offering tours for would-be paranormal investigators looking to get a couple beeps on their EVP meters. Just don't say that nobody warned you. Number 3. Epping Forest Nothing quite like a good haunted forest, is there? Nice tall trees really provoke the imagination when it comes to campfire stories, and Epping Forest is quite the setting for all kinds of creepy spine chillers. The size and density of Epping Forest has made it an infamous spot for all kinds of criminals to conduct and plan their devious crimes. In the early 1700s, it was the hunting grounds of one particularly infamous highwayman, Richard Turpin, who would hid there and commit robberies. Now, since then, more than a dozen bodies have been found all in disgusting, horrifying conditions since the 1960s. So these spooky woods have become home to all manner of urban legend and hearsay about the crimes that have taken place here. It's developed a real rep for spooky, inexplicable noises and sights, including ghastly apparitions, with some claiming that the ghost of Turpin, the infamous bandit, still resides in the woods. Robbing other ghosts, I guess? God, imagine. Imagine ghost on ghost crime. We need to do something about that. Ghostbusters, maybe. There's a legend that says that if you drive to Hangman's Hill and park your car in neutral, that your car will be slowly pulled uphill, drawn spiritually to a tree that once hung three witches on it, which was later cursed. But I gotta be honest, ignoring the witchy part, that actually sounds kind of fun. Just a little car getting towed uphill as part of a supernatural adventure, I'm on board with that. 
No doubt something that helps the forest have this scary reputation is its off-putting appearance. The trees have not been cut since the late 1800s, giving them an unusually overgrown chaotic look. I can definitely relate to not having cut something since the 1800s, I think that's the last time I cut this mop of hair. Number 2 The Queen Mary We've got a few good haunted woods, an old abandoned hospital, and I think for good measure we should toss in a haunted ship. Does this video not have any haunted houses? Wow, okay, hey, we're breaking new ground. There are few ships in the United States allegedly even half as haunted as the Queen Mary, a decommissioned ship that was converted into a hotel in Long Beach, California. It's stately, lush, and its lower decks are filled to bursting with restless spirits. The ship was christened in the mid 30s by Queen Mary herself, hence the name, and it was retired retired three decades later when it was then converted into a hotel, where guests can go and sleep in a stateroom and role play that they're crossing the Atlantic in style. But the Continental Breakfast is far from the only reason anyone goes to check it out, although I have heard it's amazing, just make sure you get there early, those eggs go fast. There's a variety of hotspots that are said to be congregation points for spirits. The most famous is Stateroom B340, a problem before the place was even haunted actually. In 1948, a passenger, Walter J. Adamson passed away in the room under unknown conditions. Nothing came of it until 1966, a woman staying in the room reported she was woken up when the bed covers were pulled away and she saw a spectral man standing at the foot of her bed. She didn't assume this was the room service, so she screamed and rang for a steward, but as soon as somebody arrived, the man had vanished. Guests staying at the room claim they hear someone knocking at the door in the middle of the night. The Mary's maids complain that they find water running in B340 when no one's been in it in days. Wet bandits, that's the sign of the wet bandits for sure. People have reported all kinds of ghosts around the pool as well. Some notable ones include a woman in an old wedding gown next to a young boy in a suit, a cloud of steam appearing out of nowhere along with a girl in a blue and white dress who disappears and reappears in an instant. Oof. I'll stay on the land I think, where all the, the land ghosts are. At least I know what those ones are, I trust them. And number 1, the Mall Dyer Rock. Do you believe in witches? For the residents of Leonardtown, Maryland, their town's history has been plagued by rumors and accusations surrounding one infamous resident, Moll Dyer, the Witch of Leonardtown. In the early 17th century, illness was ravaging this small community, taking a harsh toll on crops and wildlife, and the difficulty of the winter had crushed most residents' hopes of surviving the season. The town was deeply religious, and the harsh season led the townsfolk to believe a witch was to be blamed instead of just like poles and seasons and stuff, but they didn't really have a lot of books, so witches made a lot more sense. The church had determined that one resident in particular, Mall Dyer, an old widow who lived alone on the edge of town was the witch who was tormenting the villagers. I get it, old crone on the edge of town, bad season, all the crops died, it definitely sounds like she was a witch, but it wasn't long before hurtful hearsay like that turned into a pitchfork wielding mob who burned down Mall's small hut. Maul ran from the fire into the wilderness, but you know, being an old woman, collapsed shortly. She grabbed onto a boulder and raised her left hand to the moon and allegedly cursed at the village for what they had done to her. Her body was found frozen with her hand held upwards towards the sky. Since then, the boulder she was found on has been dubbed the Maul Dyer Rock and is actually protected with plexiglass in an attempt to contain whatever curse that she unleashed onto the world. Many supernatural events are reported in the woods around this rock, ranging from shadow people, will-o'-wisps, stories of spirits running through the road causing car accidents, thick unnatural fog, and lightning strikes around the rock are all common legends and elements of Mal Dyer's ancient curse on the town of Leonardsville. Now some fun little trivia for some horror movie fans out there, the story of Mal Dyer served as one of the inspirations for the titular character in the cult classic horror flick Blair Witch Project, you know, about a spooky witch who got isolated in the woods. So if you're ever visiting Maryland and you want to see Mall Dyer's Rock, make sure to bring the video camera, shake it all up a bunch, because if you play your cards right, that's a three picture deal and a whole movie franchise. Number five on this list is Pink Place Market. This would be a really nice place to do your shopping if it wasn't so freaking haunted. Mental Floss says, as one of the most famous public markets in the country, Pike Place Market is known for a lot of things. Fresh coffee, fresher fish, and paranormal activity. 
The Seattle Times reported on a number of figures who supposedly walk through walls or vanish into thin air. One older gentleman named Frank apparently likes to introduce himself to the living outside of a restaurant at the Alibi Room. Various other spirits also have names like Princess Angeline, Madame Nora, and the Fat Lady Barber. At one point in the early 1900s, one section of the market was home to a mortuary. Currently operating in the basement of that space is Kell's Irish Restaurant and Pub. Its manager, Patrick McAleese, recalled some eerie instances to the Times, such as a wall mirror inexplicably shattering, only to have the shards fall into a neat pile. You think someone must be pulling your leg, he said, but then you don't see anyone. So it seems that we have a full on team of ghosts here. A small village of characters who are all moving around this mall marketplace in Seattle. Because there are so many of these paranormal entities, it makes it extremely difficult for anyone to get any shopping done without having some type of ghostly interference. You can't seem to get a good coffee here without a strong side of haunting along with it. There have been multiple attempts to rid the area of ghosts, but it just simply won't do. No matter how many experts are brought in here to cleanse the area or to put these spirits at rest, they continue to terrorize the people here. Which is really too bad because from what I've heard, they have some really nice shops in here. Number 4 on this list is COS. So this is a big store in New York that has quite the haunted and terrifying history to it. Mental Floss says, New Yorkers can brush elbows with a ghost while doing some light shopping in Soho. The legend dates back to 1799 when Guliama Elmore Sons tried to elope with her fellow boarding house tenant Levi Weeks. 11 days later, her body was found at the bottom of the well in Lisbonard's Meadows which is now 129 Spring Street. Since 2014, it's been the site of a COS retail store. Levi was arrested, tried, and acquitted in the first major murder trial in America that was fully recorded by a court stenographer. His attorneys, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. But Sands Ghost is said to roam the area, a warning to other girls who might try to run off with their lovers. Curious shoppers can still see the well in COS, just head to the back of the men's department in the the basement. Okay, so I have a few questions with this one. Why, after someone was literally murdered here, do we still have this death well in this store? And also, what is a well doing in a store in the first place? Like, I get that it was the 1800s or whatever, but like, we just kept that thing as time went on. Someone literally died in that thing, and now people are wondering why there are ghosts around this place. Like, no wonder Sans Ghosts is still chilling in this area, even she is probably wondering why this well is still here. Also, can I just make a comment about ghosts in general? I get that they want to warn us about stuff and all of that, but like, why can't they just leave us a nice note or, I don't know, sit down and have a conversation? Why do they need to freak the hell out of people and just leave people confused as to what they want? Anyways, this place is going to remain haunted for a while until someone deals with that well. I'd conduct your shopping elsewhere if I was you. Number three on this list is the Cherry Vale Mall. This is just a mall that for whatever reason has decided that it wants to be haunted. Mental Floss says, since its opening in 1973, the Cherry Vale Mall in Rockford, Illinois has been the site of some spooky vibes. The Rock River Times noted that mall employees reported feeling watched or followed after the venue closed at night. Others have reported that certain stores would be a mess in the morning with clothing scattered or displays knocked over, even if the space was cleaned before being locked up. And on an even more unsettling note, some even claimed that bathroom doors were held shut by an unknown force. So basically for no good reason, this mall is just 
haunted now. Now it's either that or this mall is just regularly hit with burglary. Maybe the things are moved because people have been stealing stuff and then just don't put everything back the way that they found it when they first got there. Or, and this one's a long shot, but some people are just pranking the hell out of this mall and creating the legend of a haunting here for some reason. Like a Scooby-Doo-esque vibe where they're really trying to do something else at the mall and need people to leave it alone because they're scared. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of some reason why this mall would be haunted because there really isn't a good one. Comment down below if you guys know what could be causing this mall to be the way that it is. Number two on this list is the Diamond Center. The Diamond Center is located in Anchorage, Alaska and it's very haunted. Alaska doesn't have that many people that live there. It's the largest state in America and yet it has less than 1 million residents. Which just makes what they did with this mall so much more disrespectful. A golden rule of thumb is do not build big stuff on top of ancient Native American burial sites. Well guess what? They built the Diamond Mall on an ancient burial ground of Native Alaskans. Sure enough, what happens when you do that? Well, some pretty bad things. This mall is almost impossible to shop in now because of this and honestly rightfully so. You should never be building stuff on this land to begin with, but just think about how big Alaska is and how few people live there. Like guys, we couldn't have just moved the mall a kilometer that way and built it over there. I mean, I think that you have the space for it considering you're freaking Alaska. Ghosts and spirits run rampant here and many visitors and employees have had harrowing experiences with them. Some have even reported being attacked by these spirits and been told that they have to leave. Sadly, these people don't control what the mall does and now that it's been put down, the wealthy people who own it, they don't seem to care about these ghostly appearances. And for Finally, number one on this list is Toys R Us. So I know that Toys R Us isn't necessarily a mall, but to a kid it certainly is, and let me tell you, if you're a child, then do not go to this specific Toys R Us. The one that I'm talking about is located in Sunnyvale, California, and it's very haunted. Mental Floss says, A haunted toy store sounds like a solid horror movie plot, but it's rumored to be a reality in Sunnyvale, California. According to Stranger Dimensions, the legend goes as such. The store was built on property that was formerly a plantation. The plantation's owner, Martin Murphy, hired a preacher named Johnny Johnson. Crazy Johnny, as the preacher was nicknamed, was in love with Murphy's daughter, Elizabeth. Unfortunately, Elizabeth was planning on marrying a lawyer, and as the story has it, Johnny was angrily chopping wood one day and fatally wounded himself by accident. His ghost reportedly wanders the land, now home to the Toys R Us, looking for Elizabeth. The usual objects coming off the shelves and footsteps have been reported, but the best anecdote was of employees once hearing a voice whisper, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away over the intercom system. Imagine hearing that over the intercom. How on earth could you ever show up to your work the next day? Like, that's it guys, I am done. I am fully out of there if that's what's coming on over the intercom. I also wanna know, what is this ghost referencing? What is he planning on giving or what's he planning on taking away? Unless he really is just citing the Lord and saying that. Toy stores are supposed to be ghost free. There isn't supposed to be some haunted menace terrorizing the people who come and work here. That isn't the case at the Sunnyvale Toys R Us. And that's why I'd be buying my toys elsewhere if I was you. Number five on this list is the forest of Brosliane. Now this forest has literally had young men enter into it and then never come out again. Matador Network says, according to some Celtic legends dating back to the Middle Ages, this forest in the northern part of France was said to have a mystical aura. Some people believe these woods are the ones described in the legends of King Arthur. The wizard Merlin was said to have been briefly imprisoned in an invisible tower here and is thought to be buried at a mysterious location widely called the Tomb of Merlin. Also here is the Val Sans Retour or Valley of No Return where it's said that the King Arthur Sorceress, half-sister Morgan Le Fay, trapped and held young knights who were not faithful. After researching a decent amount about Morgan Le Fay, pretty much all of the legends indicate she's evil. She was initially supposed to be a healer but then turned bad and got corrupted by witchcraft. 
Obviously, she was using this witchcraft for no good in this forest as well. Don't get me wrong, folks. Being unfaithful and cheating on your partner, that isn't cool, but I also don't think that every single person who does it needs to get murdered by an evil witch. No one knows her exact kill count as far as how many men she lured in here to disappear forever, but from my reading, it certainly seems like a lot. It should also be noted that this forest underwent a horrible forest fire in 1990 and many people thought that there could be some sort of link to the curse that surrounds this place in some way. I don't know if that's true or not, but this was a particularly horrible forest fire, and considering what has happened here in the past, I wouldn't be totally shocked. If you do manage to make it through this forest without disappearing, then there could be great wonders awaiting if you manage to find Merlin's tomb. I would only imagine that there's some pretty incredible treasure or magical artifacts in that tomb if one was to find it. Grand Granted, we have had hundreds of years to do so, and no luck so far. Probably best to just stay away from this place and not risk disappearing for good yourself. Number 4 on this list is Smolensk Forest. This forest was particularly deadly if you happen to be a Polish soldier. That's right folks, this forest was host to one of the deadlier battles in all of history. Matador Network says, This really was the site of the Caton Massacre. During World War II, a mass grave with 20,000 Polish soldiers and military leaders secretly slaughtered by Joseph Stalin's army was discovered. Only a decade ago, a plane carrying nearly 100 of the most important political and business officials of Germany crashed here, killing everyone on board. It was a shocking day for the people of Poland, for whom this scary forest was already the site of a painful history. You can forgive them for believing that this patch of earth is cursed. So that's what happened and you better believe that it's left something behind. Tons of ghostly apparitions have been sighted here throughout the years. I mean, I think when 20,000 people die plus the tragedy with the plane, that it's just simply too much for an area to handle and bam. Now we have a haunting. Now I think it's safe to say that people have definitely disappeared here in the past based on the circumstances. But that doesn't mean that we're all good now either. I highly doubt that the ghosts who live here are going to be totally cool with people just cutting through their home now. Extreme fog has been reported here from the locals. Fog that comes on super fast without warning. It would be very easy for ghosts to snatch somebody up in all of that and make you disappear if they wanted to. Tread very carefully in Smolensk Forest. Number three on this list is Epping Forest. There could be some very scary and questionable characters lurking in this forest, people who you really shouldn't want to mess with. Matador Network says, Part of the dense urban forest that London comprises, the nine square mile Epping Forest has long been the perfect place for criminals to lay low or to bury their murdered victims. Frighteningly, more than a dozen such victims have been discovered here in the last half century. At least one murder took place in the forest itself at the hands of a notorious highwayman, Dick Turbin. Many of the trees here haven't been cut in nearly 150 years, following legislation to protect the area, leaving them with weirdly deformed shapes. Add in reportedly creepy sounds and ghostly sightings, and this is one hair-raising walk through the woods. Yeah, so when I was referencing the questionable characters, I was talking about deadly criminals, and when I said that you might not want to run into them, well, that's because they could just kill you. Clearly some sort of operation is going on in the this forest. Maybe some type of drug deal that goes down here or something like that. If you happen to be going into this forest at the wrong time and stumbled upon something like that, then that's game over. Your picture perfect hike is turning bad really fast. Clearly tons of people have disappeared here over the years. Best to steer clear of this forest if you don't want to end up joining them. Number two on this list is the Dow Hill Forest. This forest is located in India and is a place where once you enter, you may never leave. Matador Networks says, many murders are said to have taken place in these ominous mist-filled woodlands. Reports claim that those who enter feel that they are being watched, and some have even spied a red eye gazing at them and have caught a fleeting glance of an apparition in an ash-colored dress. The most off-heard rumor is of a headless boy walking on his way from the forest along Death Road to the Dow Hill Victoria Boys School, itself considered one of the most haunted locations 
kids in India. Residents who live nearby say that they hear sounds emerging from the school even when it's not in session. Any forest that has a road called Death Road just casually running through it, yeah, that's not a forest for me, guys. Hiking is supposed to be a relaxing and fun experience, not one where you're fearing for your life. That mist that I mentioned earlier as well, well, apparently that stuff is thick. Like, really thick. So thick that you can barely see the ground that you're walking on. Clearly, it's not just naturally occurring, but some sort of paranormal entity is manifesting it. And number one on this list is the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This national park is a beautiful forested area in North Carolina and Tennessee. The reason that it's made this list is because there have literally been a decent amount of documented disappearances here that no one's been able to solve. The NY Post says, The first took place on June 4th, 1969, when six-year-old Dennis Martin was scheming with his brother and two other boys in the park's Spence Field while on an annual family camping trip. They were planning to sneak up on their family and startle them. But when the boys ran and jumped on the adults, Dennis was nowhere to be found. On October 8, 1976, while on a horticulture field trip with 40 of her classmates, 16-year-old Trenny Lynn Gibson was hiking along Andrews Bald. No one can recall seeing her after 3 p.m. Searches continued for months, but no trace of Gibson was ever found. 58-year-old Thelma Pauling Melton was hiking near Deep Creek Campground, a trail she'd been on many times before on September 25, 1981. She was with friends when she walked ahead of them and vanished over a hill, but they couldn't find her on the other side, nor could they find her at the campground where she was staying. Where are these people going, and why can't anyone find them? It's been decades, and there still isn't any trace of these folks. Yes, obviously, this is a big park and it would be hard to locate someone if they tripped and fell. But still, this has got people thinking that something far more sinister is afoot. A killer of some kind, potentially, who uses this park as their hunting grounds. Whether this killer is human or some type of entity, no one knows for sure. Just stay away from this park so you don't need to be the one to find out. Number 5 on this list is the Beechworth Lunatic Asylum. Located in Australia, this is one of the most haunted asylums in the entire world. Thrillist says, formerly the Mayday Hills Lunatic Asylum, now La Trobe University scenic Beechworth campus, this place saw 128 years of terror before closing in 1995. Apparently 9,000 patients died here over the years and people were so fast and loose with the term lunatic that few patients ever left the premises alive. It comes as no surprise that a few people lingered after death. Faces floating in windows are a common sight, along with Matron Sharp doing her rounds and children laughing. Tommy Kennedy, who used to transport the dead out of the asylum and died there himself, still hangs around. There's also a woman who was thrown out of a window and died in front of the hospital because she was Jewish and the only person allowed to move her, a rabbi, couldn't make it to Beechworth sooner. Yeah, so clearly this place has seen its fair share of trauma throughout the years, folks. 9,000 people is a lot of people who have died. Like, we're talking about a small town's worth of human beings who died at this freaking asylum. And as exampled by that poor Jewish woman, these deaths weren't all from natural causes either. There was said to be some sick workers here. People who were twisted and got off on hurting others. People who worked at the asylum but probably would have been better suited to be in it themselves. Asylums in general are already susceptible to haunting considering what's going on, but when you have this amount of death and atrocities take place, it just makes it that much easier for ghosts and paranormal entities to cling on. Many of the locals don't even come close to this place anymore, and a lot of the tourists who do go here thoroughly regret that decision soon afterwards. These entities are angry and want to punish those who are living for what happened way back then. I don't recommend being one of the people who gets punished. Number 4 on this list is the Gongium Psychiatric Hospital. If you had a mental illness, then I promise you this is not where you wanted to end up. Thrillist says, believed to be one of the most haunted spots in South Korea, this abandoned psych hospital could be the basis for the next Stephen King novel based on its checkered history. According to local lore, patients here began dying mysterious deaths one after the other, forcing the facility to shut down. Many believe the murderous owners of the place was to blame, claiming that he kept patients as hostages only to flee to the states when families of the deceased demanded explanations. There are also rumors of doctors going insane, rivaling their patients in madness. So literally folks, if you ended up here, then there was a pretty good chance that not only did you not get the help that you needed, but you also just died. 
Whether this was because of the sick owners or the doctors, who even knows? That much death has left behind its mark though, and now this place looks like a safe haven for ghosts and everything paranormal. There's also been talk of a creature that lurks here, a creature that was actually the cause of all this death to begin with and is lurking, waiting for somebody to stop by and take them next. If I was you, I wouldn't want to be that person. Number 3 on this list is the Trans Algony Lunatic Asylum. This is a scary masterpiece, folks. Thrillist says, This impressive structure, allegedly the world's second largest hand-cut stone masonry building after the Kremlin, looks like it was designed as the set of a blockbuster thriller. Built around the Civil War era, the asylum was designed to house around 250 patients, but ended up holding more than 2400, including for a brief period, the infamous Charles Manson. That's the opposite of a celebrity endorsement. Along with severe overcrowding, profound abuse abounded people were locked in cages, lobotomized with ice picks, chained to things, and the combination led to hundreds of deaths and a palpable air of suffering. Apparitions are a plenty, like the still deranged patient Ruth who likes to attack visitors. And since the asylum was also briefly a civil war military base, uniformed soldier ghosts roam the halls. Thousands have claimed to hear voices telling them to get out. Civil war themed ghost tours, tours of the medical center, forensic buildings and geriatrics buildings, and zombie events and balls fully play up the twisted history on the campus grounds. Now, don't get me wrong, would it be really fun to be part of a zombie event at this place? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm also not trying to get attacked by Ruth, the deranged ghost patient. Whenever people travel to a place like this, there is a risk involved. I personally am not willing to take the risk based on the history that this place has seen. Comment down below if you would. Number 2 on this list is Danfer's Lunatic Asylum. This asylum hosted a very select group, criminals. Thrillist says, part prison, part asylum, all terror. This gothic monolith opened in 1878 to house mentally unstable criminals. Thanks to the addition of the mentally handicapped, alcoholics, and plain old felons, it became so severely understaffed by the 1930s that patients' deaths were often not discovered until days later, when they were found rotting in some forgotten corner. Shock therapy and lobotomies were standard procedures. In fact, some called Danvers the birthplace of the prefrontal lobotomy. But a large cemetery on site said to be haunted by evil spirits suggests these were not always successful. The sinister castle-like building is said to have inspired H.P. Lovecraft's Arkham Sanitarium and so also Batman's Arkham Asylum and was the setting of demon movie Session 9. And as if that weren't enough, Danvers used to be Salem Village. Yeah, of Salem witch trials fame. Regular ghosts are one thing, witch ghosts are another one altogether. Think about how few people would have had to work here where a literal patient would die and wouldn't be discovered until days later. And also think about what that would have meant for the actual patients. That means that even if you were still alive, you probably wouldn't be treated or seen by a professional for days at a time. Which also means that you might not eat for days at a time either and be stuck in what I can only assume would have been a cell by yourself for that entire time. This would have been a horrible place to go, even if it was just for criminals. Because of all of this, it is now deeply haunted and a place I highly recommend avoiding. And finally, number one on this list is the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. This is an asylum that I've talked about a few times on this channel before, which speaks to how haunted it actually is. Thrillist says, with an alleged 63,000 deaths taking place inside its walls, this place is up to its eyeballs and spirits, not surprisingly topping lists of America's most haunted spots. Originally built as a tuberculosis hospital in 1910, the building saw many die from the disease, but tales of mistreatment and dubious human experimentation trickled out, and patients left the premises in what was known as the death tunnel or body shoot. Apparitions including Timmy, a boy who likes to play with rubber balls who's been caught on tape, the nurse who hanged herself in room 502, another nurse who fell from the same room's window, and scattered screams and footsteps have all been seen. 63,000 deaths. And here we were thinking that the 9,000 in the other place was bad, here's 63,000 more. Any place that has a death tunnel and a body chute, that should not be a place meant for rehabilitation and seeking help. We are talking about some sick stuff that went on here. I would get into some of the rumors associated with the human experimentation, but I honestly don't think that YouTube would let this video stay up if I did. There are a plethora of ghostly spirits that haunt this place now. 
Dark spirits that have lost all sense of humanity and are more demon than spirit. This is a spot that must be avoided at all costs. Welcome back to the fog, my friends. I'm Taylor, your casual crypt keeper, and I've got something for you today. Buy a plane ticket because today we are taking a trip down to China to see the places you've been told not to go. This is the top five scary, forbidden places in China the government doesn't want you to know. Shout out down below which of these forbidden destinations you would book a flight for. Number five, Fengdu Ghost City. Fengdu Ghost City, well, right off the bat, I feel like this is probably a spooky place. You don't name cities Ghost City unless there's a good reason for it. Well, the good reason is that the city got its name during the Eastern Han Dynasty. Two imperial nobles, Yin Changshen and Wang Fengpin, came to Ming Mountain to discover a way to achieve immortality. Combining their two names, Yin and Wang, Ying Wang, translates to King of Hell, and that cemented the site as an underworld hotspot. Since then, the place was built to be a shrine to the underworld world with several temples showing paintings and sculptures of people being punished for their sins and cast into eternal damnation. It's pretty spooky, but honestly, it's pretty cool. It's good craftsmanship. And there is some rich folklore to go with the place. Chinese mythology and beliefs say that the dead must pass three tests before they're allowed to cross into the underworld, which sounds exhausting to me. I can't even enjoy the relief of death before you're asked to solve some riddles and pass some tests. The village is kind of like a place to conduct these tests, and now you can actually go to it yourself and do it as a tourist attraction and watch performers act out all the trials. But here's the trials. The first test is passing the Bridge of Helplessness, which does sound a little bit like it's from one of the Dark Souls games. It was built during the Ming Dynasty, and good souls are allowed to pass, while evil ones will fall into the water below. Then, you proceed to Ghost Torturing Pass. Oh, well, that's a fun place to be, where they present themselves for judgment. Finally, the last test is at the entrance to Tianzi Palace, where the ghost must stand on a certain stone on one foot for three minutes straight. I don't know why I'm standing on one foot when the camera is above my waist. You can't tell what I'm doing. I could be standing on as many feet as I want. A good soul will be able to do it, an evil one will fall over. Now this site now is a popular tourist destination due to its very unique structures and fascinating, if not a little bit horrifying decor. I'd I'd want one of those little statues maybe have in my house. I think they're kinda cool, to be honest. And if you're looking for more hellish haunted spots, terrifying tales of poltergeists, ghosts, ghouls, cryptids, aliens, and all kind of freaks under the sun and above it, while Top 5 Scary is simply the only place to be. Subscribe and stay scared. Number 4, Kaishiku Grounds. If you go to Kaishiku today, you probably wouldn't think much of it at all. The uh, most notable thing around there is a subway station, and aside from that, there's a vegetable market outside, and you can probably score a pretty decent deal on corn. But if you visited Kaishiku back in the 19th century, however, when it served as an execution grounds for prisoners, you probably wouldn't feel too welcome. Thousands of prisoners were brought to the Kaishiku grounds to serve out their last moments. Every autumn, prisoners were taken through the Zuan Women, which earned the fun nickname, the Gate of death at dawn. Awesome. The doomed would then be lined up east to west, their necks stretched by rope to make it easier to chop. Well, that's good. We always want to make it as easy as possible for the guy chopping necks. A singular chop to the neck was considered the easy way out of a one-way trip to Kaishiku. Prisoners accused of more serious crimes would be sentenced to Lingchi, which was a horrid punishment of slowly slicing someone many, many, many many times, leading to it sensationally being dubbed the death of a thousand cuts by outsiders. These executions were designed to be a public spectacle, something for everybody to come and enjoy, something for the whole family to do when no good movies were playing. Kaishiku was one of the busiest intersections in the outer city of Beijing, so crowds would gather to see these things. Most horrifically about this though, is that sometimes the prisoners who were executed, their bodies were photographed and made into postcards. Given this sordid history, is it much of a surprise at all? that passers-by and visitors claim that they can sometimes see ghostly apparitions making their way through the dark hours of the night, or that you can hear screams at all hours? If you ever visit Beijing and make a stop by Kaishiku, take a photo. The, uh, the postcards they sell in the gift shop are a little, uh, dicey. Number three, the Forbidden City. The Forbidden City. Well, that tracks. That sounds very forbidden. Well, back in the 14th century, when it stood as the heart of the Ming Dynasty and served as an imperial palace, yeah, you'd have a pretty difficult time getting access if you were but a common serf like myself. But I think they've relaxed their stance just a little bit because I found more than a few Google recommended articles for tourist things to do in the Forbidden City. I think they just charge like price of admission now. So it's actually very easy to get into the Forbidden City and the Chinese government does know about this. So the formerly Forbidden City, which is not quite as catchy a name, is a beautiful tourist spot and definitely worth checking out. It's got 
years upon years of culture and rich history behind it, and most importantly, it's said to be very haunted. The Forbidden City is a pretty credible place for a haunting, if I must say. Ghosts are said to be born out of a place of malice, and the Forbidden City has over 600 years of deaths, assassinations, and who knows how many backstabs and plot twists were the intriguer out there. The most recurring ghost story coming out of the Forbidden City, though, is that there's a ghost of a weeping woman, all dressed in white, wandering during the dark hours. Following her is a lingering flute playing. Visitors claim at times they see ghost dogs that run through corridors at the edge of the city, digging up ghost bones. Some travelers report feeling an indescribable strangeness while wandering through the temples. Could it just be they're overcome with beauty and majesty of one of the wonders of the world, or is there spectral energy floating through the air? Before we move off on this one, I want you to take a look at this. A travel blog from Vancouver posted about their experiences traveling through the Imperial City. They noted how odd it was that all the doorways had a raised platform. The guide told them that was a way to confuse ghosts to keep them out. They took tons of photos, but only one stood out for them when they came back. See anything suspicious? Like a ghostly figure just kind of hanging right there in the center? Ugh. Number 2. Dead Fengmen Village Coming up next on this list is going to be Fengmen Village. Fengmen Village is sometimes known as Dead Fengmen's Village, which is not exactly the most welcoming name you want to hear, but there's a pretty good reason for it though. The village itself is about as dead as a village can be, long abandoned by an unknown tribe. It's located in the valley of a nameless mountain in northern China's Henan province. An abandoned city left in a nameless mountain. It seems like it's the start of a chosen one, like heroic journey out there, start of a quest. The surrounding landscape is supposedly quite beautiful. A flowing brook, a, a lush forestry and trees and buildings from the Qing dynasty. 39 buildings, 200 rooms, all of them left completely vacant. And the weird part? No one even knows why. There is extremely little information to be found on Fengmen Village. Who lived there, what happened to them, and so on, so on. Making it absolutely rife for urban legends of hauntings and ghosts. It's a fairly popular spot for backpackers and hikers with an interest in the supernatural who are looking to discover something in the lost village. One story tells of a hiker named Matreya who would make expeditions out to Fengmen Village camping alongside the river just outside with a few companions. On one of his treks, he got the bright idea in the middle of the night to prank his companions by jumping and scaring them, which let me just say, I absolutely have to respect that. You're camping out in an abandoned ghost village, you have to seize the opportunity to prank your friends just a little bit. Well before he got a chance, he got served up his own scare, because he swears a discordant, sad sounding voice kept calling his name out over and over, in a voice he said he couldn't recognize or had never heard before and none of his friends had any idea what he was talking about. At number one, Chow Nai 81. Our next entry is Chow Nai number 81, a building that has a fairly notable reputation, being listed as the most haunted building in Beijing. It's Beijing's most famous haunted house. The ghost most commonly reported in this house is that of a woman who was the wife of an officer in the National Revolutionary Army during the Chinese Civil War in the late 1940s. He had fled to Taiwan with his compatriots before the end of the war and left left his precious wife behind. Naturally, she was pretty upset about this. She was despondent. She felt that without her husband, she had nothing left to live for and thusly took her own life. And her spirit has been trapped in the house ever since. Residents who live around the area claim that during thunderstorms you can hear shrill, violent screaming coming from inside the house. Visitors report that walking into the house immediately, like immediately, you feel a cold chill come over you and a feeling of inescapable dread. Not good. Not good to feel those things. There are stories of people going inexplicably missing connected to this mysterious house. One notable story is that of a British priest who was said to have initially built the property to serve as a church who went missing shortly before it was finished. When an investigation was launched to look for him, they supposedly discovered a secret tunnel that led to a neighborhood in the northeast and the priest's body was never discovered. Now another story was that three construction workers in the basement of a neighboring building weren't paying attention to what they were doing and broke through a thin wall leading into building 81. They went through the hole and the three of them vanished. And now there are people who conspire that this event is what led the government to cancel its plans to demolish the building for fear that it might be haunted. And it hasn't been yet because it's still standing there and you're more than welcome to visit. You can take a guided ghost tour if you're feeling brave enough and hopefully you come back. Well, that's all she wrote my ghouls and goblins. Thanks so much for watching as always. Take it easy and creep on creeping on. Well
While Sunnydale and the Hellmouth may be places of fiction, one simply cannot deny that there's a hotbed of demonic and unexplainable evil terror that has its roots in California. From hotels to ghost towns, schools, and more, there's plenty to fear from the Golden State. My name is Alexa, and today we'll be taking a closer dig into places you may not want to visit if you value your life and sanity. Here are the top five demonic places in California hiding pure evil. In fifth place, we have Preston Castle, also known as the Preston School of Industry in Ione. Opening in 1894 and named after state senator at the time, Edward Myers Prestonas, it was presented as an alternative to juvie, a place to send troubled boys to learn a new trade and avoid incarceration. To the general public, it quickly became known as the best reform school of its kind, where boys could grow their own food, raise livestock, learn farming trades and skills for, for self-preservation in the real world. Known as wards, minors under guardianship of the state, but not necessarily juvenile offenders, many boys passed from severe illnesses like tuberculosis or were simply killed by guards for reasons unknown. Records show that the initiation to the facility involved swimming through a pool filled with lye, and common discipline methods included starvation, isolation, public paddling, and lashings. A mass grave on the property contains at least 23 bodies of wards that were sent to be rehabilitated. Head housekeeper of the facility, Anna Corbin, was brutally beaten to death on February 23rd of 1950. Various students and members of the staff were suspects in her passing, but it remains unsolved. Visitors to the now landmark have reported meeting her spirit, which roams around the grounds with all the students that couldn't pass over. Physical representations of spirits at this location have included multiple slamming doors, falling objects, disembodied voices, and the feeling of being touched by a cold hand all common pranks that are meant to terrorize and discombobulate. In fourth place, we have the Los Coches Adobe in Soledad. Before the establishment even broke ground, back when the area was used primarily for mining, over 30 miners perished in a soil collapse, and visitors to the area have since reported hearing their cries for help from the now abandoned mine shaft, while feeling pressure on their chest and back as if they were being buried alive. The adobe itself is located on the side of Highway 101 the building being originally built in 1843 to be used as lodging for workers in the area. Between 1872 and 1886, Soledad served as the terminal station for the railway that connected to San Francisco. Legend says that the owner of the inn was responsible for ending the lives of multiple folks who stayed there, especially near the end of the inn being in use, by entering the rooms as they slept and slitting their throats before stealing their riches in an attempt to keep the inn, well, afloat. Other spirits spotted on the property include, but are not limited to, a man hanging from a tree swaying in the wind, and a woman sitting while holding a pointer stick, with her mouth moving as if she's yelling at whoever spots her. It is reported that the wall between the living and the dead is so thin here that people who have stayed in recent history reported having the walls and surroundings inside of the building change them to match the settings of the once deadly inn before their very eyes. Those who have opted to go so far as to stay the night have often woken up with handprints on their chest or throat, a remnant of what came before. In third place, time to visit the Bodie State Historic Park. Formerly a genuine gold mining town located east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in Mono County, California, and now a national landmark, it is known as one of the best preserved ghost towns in the world. It is named after W.S. Bodie, first name unknown, but rumored to be either William or Waterman, discovered gold in 1859 in an area now known as Brody Bluff. He tragically passed in a snowstorm that same winter and was never present for what came to be. According to pioneer Judge McClinton, the district's name was changed from the proper spelling of B-O-D-E-Y to B-O-D-Y, body, and then a few other phonetic variations to eventually become B-O-D-I-E after a painter in the nearby boomtown of Aurora lettered a sign as such. You know, an accidental typo that stuck through history. While the output from the mine is largely insignificant in terms of mining history, the violence and early endings to lives tell a different story. A particularly harsh winter between 1878 and 1879 claimed hundreds of lives, with many others perishing from falling timber and explosions underground. Bodie as a town grew to have a reputation for violence and lawlessness. And unlike other mining camps at the time, killings were daily events. 
robberies, stage holdups, and fights happened at such a frequency that no complete record could be kept. Reverend F. M. Warrington would describe the area in 1881 as a sea of sin lashed by the tempests of lust and passion. The first of four mysterious fires tore through the business district in 1892, the next destroying the town mill in 1912, and yet another destroying the same mill again in 1898. The last of the unknown fires demolished most of what was left of the now ghost town in 1932, taking way too many lives too soon in the process. When the last producing mine shut down after 1945, very few people were left living in what was left of the town, and all eventually met untimely ends. One man shot his wife unprompted, and three other men from the town took it upon themselves to take his life for that act. According to historians, the ghost of that man would visit the three men after his passing, shaking his fist and appearing as if he was cursing them out. Those men soon died of mysterious diseases and illnesses. Visitors to the area have reported meeting spirits that leave them feeling suffocated, seeing doors open and close on their own, and rocking chairs that may or may not have a menacing older lady staring them down, or even the empty chair rocking on its own. Nowadays, Bodhi may be a tourist destination, but if you remove anything from the land, even so little as a pebble, you'll be cursed with remorse and tragedy. The park keeps a logbook of all letters and items returned to them, with each thief writing an apology note to Brody for what was taken. The curse is upheld by the ghosts of residents past who guard against thieves and protect the town's treasures. Coming in second place, we have the Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles, which was renamed to the Stay on Main in 2011. Cited as one of the inspirations for American Horror Story, Hotel, its history includes multiple deaths by a single hand and more unexplainable horrors. The first documented end of life at the Cecil occurred on the evening of January 22, 1927, when Percy Ormond Cook, age 52 at the time, shot himself in the head while inside his hotel room after spending over $40,000 in an attempt to woo back his estranged wife and an attempt to buy happiness. The next death that was reported was in 1931, when a guest, W.K. Norton, passed in his room after taking poison capsules. Too many lives to list were self-taken at the height of the Great Depression in the 40s and 50s. In 1947, it was claimed that Elizabeth Short, otherwise known as the Black Dahlia, was spotted at the hotel days before her gruesome and unsolved end of time. On the topic of unsolved deaths, we move ahead to 1964, when a retired telemarketer named Pigeon Goldie Osgood, who had been a well-known long-term resident at the hotel, was found brutally ended in her room with said room having been ransacked. In the 1980s, the hotel was home for a few weeks to a repeated ender of lives Richard Ramirez, nicknamed the Night Stalker. It's assumed that he engaged in most, if not not all of his killing spree while staying there, being convicted of 13 deaths total in 1989. A copycat of his, Jack Unterweger, stayed at the Cecil in 1991 and was responsible for the strangulation and death of at least three women of the night. The most recent death reported took place in 2013, when surveillance footage of Canadian student Elisa Lam behaving erratically in the hotel's elevator went viral. The video depicts Lam repeatedly pressing the elevator's buttons, walking in and out of the elevator, and was recorded shortly before her disappearance. After 19 days of being missing, her naked body was discovered in a water supply cistern on the hotel roof, following complaints from guests of odd-tasting water and low pressure. And finally, in first place, we have the famed Winchester Mystery House in San Jose. It all began in 1881, when the passing of Sarah Winchester's mother, father-in-law, and husband, William Winchester, of the famed Winchester Repeating Arms Company, passed away in quick succession, leaving her with a very large inheritance, assumed to be around $20 million, which would amount to roughly $561.6 million today, and a 50% stake in the company, making her one of the wealthiest women at the time. After living in Connecticut for the majority of her life, a combination of an arthritis diagnosis and meeting with a medium convinced her to start a new life in California. She believed her family to be cursed by victims of the Winchester rifle, and began construction on what was originally a two-story, eight-room farmhouse, which she purchased in 1886. She and her late husband shared an interest in architecture, and after dismissing all the architects she originally met with, decided to do all of the home planning herself. She was known to rebuild and abandon construction if anything didn't meet her expectations, which resulted in a maze-like design. It is believed that said maze-like design was mainly intended to confuse and keep spirits from harming her and what was left of her family. According to paranormal investigators Mary Jo Ignafo and Joe Nickel, the bell tower built on the 
property was used to summon spirits, and Sarah was known to throw lavish parties for the beings she feared in an attempt to please them. It was reported in the San Jose News in 1897 that a seven-story tower was torn down and rebuilt 16 times. As a result of her expansions, there are walled-off exterior windows and doors that lead to nowhere, along with staircases that end suddenly, and as the house grew in size, up to five additional levels were added to the home. When the 1906 San Francisco earthquake hit, the damage to the home was quite extensive. The seven-story tower and most of the chimneys collapsed. An entire wing was destroyed, along with the third and fourth story additions, and pipes that were protruding from what were once window boxes. Before the earthquake, the house is believed to have had 500 rooms, and at this time of Sarah's passing in 1922, the house had 160 rooms, 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows, 47 stairways, 47 fireplaces, 13 bathrooms, and 6 kitchens. Visitors to the house today have reported multiple instances of experiencing cold spots, footsteps, cooking smells, odd sounds, whispering, doors and windows slamming, and feelings of being watched. Hello out there my friends through the fog, I'm Taylor, your casual crib keeper, but you already knew that, and I got something for you today. We've been exploring the globe lately, looking for the spookiest paranormal hotspots around the world, hunting the earth's most haunted places. Today we're going to take a trip down to India to investigate the places the locals would tell you to avoid. Let's dive on in for the top 5 demonic places in India that are hiding pure evil. What country would you want to see us do a deep Deep dive on next or states, you know. Let us know in the comments and maybe we'll see it in a future video. Number five, Bangar Fort. Now, if you Google Bangar Fort, if you're planning a trip up there anytime soon, almost every result will give you back something like India's most notorious or India's most haunted. So maybe that should give you a bit of a sense as to what's going on here. It's uh, bad news. In fact, the place is said to be so filled to bursting with malevolent spirits that the Indian government actually restricts tourists from visiting after sunset for fear of spiritual danger. Let's take a look at the history of the Bangar Fort, one of the most notorious haunted places in India if the search engine is anything to go by. The fort was first built in the 17th century and according to local legends, a religious ascetic lived nearby to the fort and insisted that any house built near the fort shouldn't be taller than its own house. Not sure why, but he just didn't want to be upstaged, I guess. If the shadow of any house fell on his own, he would destroy the fort, he threatened. When columns were added to the fort that casted a shadow, the fort was destroyed and abandoned seemingly overnight. Now, a variant of this legend suggests that a priest who practiced black magic and was a practitioner of the occult was in love with a la princess who lived in the fort. He offered her a love elixir, and when she refused his proposal, he cursed the entire village, condemning it to be damned by the spirits for eternity. Locals claim that walking by the Bangar fort, you can hear women screaming and crying from within at night, and strange otherworldly music can be heard playing seemingly from nowhere. Other residents claim claim that they see shadowy wisps or ethereal lights coming out of the fort's structure alongside strange smells? What does a ghost smell like, I wonder? You know what? Don't let me know. That's maybe one that's better left not knowing. The reason for the ban after sunset is because local legends say that any person who enters the fort during the night will never be seen again and will become one of the spirits trapped inside. So maybe just stay within the guidelines and follow the signs just this once. And if you're looking for more videos about haunted hot spots, alien sightings, cryptids, creepy crawlies, and basically just about anything scary under the sun and above it, well, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So click on through, subscribe, stay scared, and don't miss a single scream. But do that after you finish watching this video, okay? We worked hardish on it. Number 4, Tunnel 33. Shimla is said to be one of the most beautiful cities in the entire country of India and happens to also be home to some of the more haunted hot spots. Now this one in particular might not be as scary as some of the other ones in this list. I thought maybe I'd give you a little break before we really got into it. But this ghost has been described as a lot friendlier than your average spirit. More of a Casper, if you will. Tunnel 33 is the longest tunnel in the Kalka Shimla railway track built in the late 18th century in 1898. British railway engineer Colonel Balrog was the man in charge of constructing the project. Colonel Balrog, I'm pretty sure he was a Street Fighter character. Colonel Balrog was given a thin deadline and he failed to meet expectations for the tunnel, leading to him being humiliated in his career after the British government was understandably pretty upset with him. Distraught, completely despondent, he ended up taking his own life and was buried near the incomplete tunnel on the railroad tracks where his spirit has remained ever since. Residents report seeing apparitions of the good colonel through the tunnel, sometimes saying 
they see him standing, admiring his work, riding his horse, or if you really believe some of the more out there stories, he's even been seen talking to tourists and locals as they pass through, asking questions about his tunnel and if the project is going well and if they're meeting deadlines. The poor guy is still so focused on his work all these years later. Take a break, man, for us, please. A phantasmal 15. You've earned it. There's something very sad about a ghost who's stuck on the land he worked on, unable to move on. He's not interested in haunting or scaring anyone, but just doomed to check in on a project he never got to see completed. If you ever visit the Accursed Tunnel, and if you happen to see the Colonel, tell him thank you. Won't you? For, for me, okay? Tell him that the tunnel looks great and he did a good job. I'm sure he'd appreciate it. Number 3. Remoji Film City Remoji Film City is one of the biggest film sets in the country. In fact, it's actually one of the largest film complexes in the entire world. I mean, it's a film city. How many other film cities are there really? It's a big attraction for movie lovers who come the world over to see its extravagant displays and exhibits, but also entices paranormal hunters looking for proof of the other world. And there's a little something for everyone here, you know? It's a real family place. So where does the haunting come from? Do the ghosts just love the silver screen? Well, Remoji Film City was allegedly built on an old Nizam battleground. The Nizam of Hyderabad was the ruling caste of the area in the 18th century. Now, if these stories are true and it is built on an old battlefield, then it makes sense that there would be a good amount of lingering evil and restless spirits trapped in the soil that haven't moved on. Dying violently tends to make ghosts. Guests of the film city claim that while visiting, lights will flicker and turn on and off at random. Now that could be bad wiring, but it also could be troublesome spirits. Where things get kind of spooky is the reports of crew members on film sets getting injured under mysterious circumstances. Equipment malfunctioning or outright being destroyed in front of people's very eyes. And these are some of the more common reports of things happening on the cursed set. Women in particular have felt targeted by the ghosts or spirits in the Remoji film city. Actresses have claimed that they felt like they were being watched in their green rooms or even feeling a supernatural tugging at their clothes during filming. Now I'm sure they make all kinds of genres of movie at the Remoji film city, but if you want my professional advice, I think they should definitely consider filming a horror movie there. It sounds like they would save a ton on the special effects budget, or maybe they could make a documentary. Do you need to pay a ghost? If you're gonna have a ghost in a movie, do ghosts still have the same workers' rights? Somebody look into that for me. Number two, the Charleville Mansion. We're headed back to Shimla for this next one. It sounds like if you're booking a trip to India to take in the sights and the spirits, Shimla is the number one place to be. Beautiful and filled with ghosts. Once you're done checking out the tunnel, take a trip to the Charleville Mansion, said to be the home to an old poltergeist. It's a century old abandoned fort built during the British rule, and its first owner was a British officer whose name has seemingly been lost to time. Probably something like Wilford Brimley, no, that's a different guy. When the officer and his wife moved into the mansion in 1913, they were unaware of the rumors surrounding it, and they just thought they were getting a great deal on rent. A previous owner had already fled the property because of the hauntings that had taken place. They said that there was a ghostly figure that would slowly apparate in the middle of the night and would smash objects and throw them around the house. Now, despite this house being haunted, the officer himself didn't personally believe in ghosts. He wanted to test this theory of whether or not there was a poltergeist in his home, and so he locked all of the doors in his house and waited. Just sat there twiddling his thumbs, tapping his feet, waiting for a ghost to approach. Well, lo and behold, after locking all the doors, he heard a crash upstairs and ran upstairs, opened the door, and found that this one room had all of the furniture and all of the mirrors just utterly demolished. I think he moved out the same week. They say he moved out shortly after, but I can't even imagine he finished packing his bags. Now the next owner was one Victor Bailey, an assistant secretary working on the railway construction at the time. And I gotta say, there must be some really bad vibes at the Shimla Railway if two entries on this list involve it. Anyway, the Baileys moved into the mansion, and at first it seemed like a great deal. Beautiful mansion secluded away from the rest of the world. Until one day at a dinner party, one of their guests reported that he was talking to a lovely English gentleman. Victor Bailey was a bit confused, and when he went back to go introduce himself to this guest, he watched the man disappear into the room the poltergeist destroyed, just vanished out of thin air. And the Baileys packed their bags and left shortly after. The mansion is now deserted and is a hot spot for paranormal activity. So, enter if you dare. I actually don't even know if you can go in. Look into that, maybe. <laughs> 
Number one, Dumas Beach. And we all love a good beach vacation. If you're looking for somewhere sweet to lay back while sipping on something sweet, India is full of some beautiful beaches. But we are not here to talk about anything lovely, okay? This isn't top five lovely, although that would be just delightful. I would love to work on top five lovely if we're ever gonna make that a channel. Maybe you guys are listening. We're going to Dumas Beach, located along the Arabian Sea in Gujarat. The first thing you'll notice about this beach that stands out is the black sand which is already pretty unnerving. Most beaches don't look like that. The local folklore says that Dumas Beach used to be a burial ground for Hindu people. And as such, generations of spirits are ingrained into the sand. Building on this legend says that the reason for the obsidian colored sand is years worth of cremated ash by the burning of the dead, eventually overtaking the sand on the beach. So, I don't know, if you're thinking about making a sand castle, maybe think twice about that. Maybe keep the flip flops on too, okay? So what do people say about the spirits out there? Well, it's been said there's a negative aura present in the air, and even just while visiting, tourists and residents say they can feel this sense of dread that something is wrong immediately walking around there. Locals say that the spirits of the dead walk down the beach at night, and visitors claim to hear inexplicable voices, scary laughter, and crying. So if you want a nice, long, romantic walk down the beach in India, just keep in mind that you're gonna have a bit of an audience with you. Some people go so far as to say that there's been apparition, floating orbs seen around the beach. I was having a bit of trouble finding any photos of any ghost sightings around the beach. People say dogs behave strangely, walking through it, howling and barking. There are some who believe that the animals can see spirits we can't, and this could be evidence of that. Now, the most extreme legends say that the tourists go missing around midnight on the beach, but I want to believe if people kept going missing on a beach, they'd shut it down, but I don't know. I've seen Jaws. I know that's not actually that likely. Number five. Chateau de Montsegur, a petite and quaint fortress in southern France, sitting atop a 170 meter drive uphill. Its ruins now nothing but rock and rubble, but once a safe house for the Cathars. The Cathar vision of the universe was dualist, in that good and light confronts evil and darkness. Right? Pretty straightforward. Very Jedi of them. This belief led them to follow a very disciplined way of life. Before, of course, they were decimated from the Catholic Church, initiated by Pope Innocent III. Innocent, huh? The ruins nickname now, Satan's Synagogue. Yeah, nice and light right off the top, huh Kyle? Described as one of the last Cathar castles, and has been listed as a monument historique by the French Ministry of Culture. Cathar, from Greek meaning pure, these people were devote. In 1233, the site became the seat and head of the Cathar Church. The fort roughly housed about 500 people during this time. In 1242, a military of about 10,000 troops fought against the castle that was held up by only 100 Cathars. So like very Jedi all of a sudden. The siege lasted nine months. Until two years later, the castle finally surrendered. North of 200 Cathars were burned in a giant bonfire, unless they renounced and changed their faith. Some taking the Cathar vow just weeks before this. Those who renounced the Cathar faith were allowed to leave, but the castle itself destroyed. The field below, now famously known to have been where hundreds of men and women were burned alive. The apparent bonfire that happened sparked a curse from the Cathar peoples. Legends of these ruins say, any person who strays off the marked footpaths of these ruins and loses their footing will drop off of every side of the citadel in the sky. Sounds more like a metaphor to me than a curse. Number four, Kalau Papa. In 1866, during the reign of Kamehameha V, Hawaiian officials passed a law designating this island the official site for patients affected with leprosy. Kalau Papa, a small peninsula in the north shore of Molokai, has quite a bitter and spooky history. The king exiled those who contracted Hansen's disease here, noting it was the ideal spot secluded and surrounded by the highest cliffs in the world. The peninsula served as a natural outdoor prison, accessible only by one steep path by foot, or boat to shore. About 1,200 families were exiled to quarantine here. At the time, the disease wasn't really understood, believing it to be very incurable. Whisked off and locked away amid paradise in total isolation. No amenities, no buildings, or even potable water. Known by historians who visit it as, quote, the pit of hell itself. And apparently the most cursed place on earth. Yeah, I didn't know that. With this grim history of loneliness, despair, and death, it's not really surprising at all that Kalau Papa is said to be one of the most haunted places in all of Hawaii. This island was basically a death sentence for those on it. Shackles, cages, caves, sounds about right to be haunted by the afterlife. Number three, the vanishing village. Way up north, 
a village named after a bountiful, massive freshwater lake in Canada's Nunavut. 1932. A Canadian fur trapper and explorer went to the village of Anjakuni Lake. The people's known there for their markets of elaborate fish and extensive wine. This village was a staple for most on the map. Joe Labelle, a well-known fur trapper and well-known in the village, had an otherworldly sight when he arrived. He arrived and sensed something was a little wrong, a little too quiet, too foggy. He found that the village was completely emptied and deserted, even though there were lots of signs of life still present. Campfires blazing, pots still boiling, doors were even open, and food out waiting to be served. Thousands of Anjakuni villagers had simply vanished. He sent a telegraph to the closest RCMP office and told them about his account. And here's the scary part. They launched an official investigation which was never solved. They took a testimony from another trapper and his two sons who said they saw a large cylindrical object transform into a bullet shape before flying directly over Anjakuni Lake. At the village, the police found the kayaks were still on the beach, meals still in the early stages of rot, and apparently the headstones were even stacked neatly in piles on either side of the graves. Uh, okay? To this day, there's no proper explanation for this mass disappearance of people and the hundreds of empty graves. Number two, Skeleton Lake. Deep within the Himalayas of India lays the bay of an ancient lake, shrouded by an ancient mystery. Rupkund Lake, famously known as Skeleton Lake. It was rediscovered by the British Forest Rangers in 1942 and what they found was pretty jarring. Hundreds of ancient human skeletons found at the edge of the lake. Investigations led some to think that this was a catastrophe of some sort, or the remains of a legendary event where a group was suddenly killed in a violent storm around the 9th century. Nope! Three different groups of people died here all at different times. It's not located on or near a trade route, no evidence of any ancient bacteria pathogen, ruling out diseases. Yeah, this one's really weird. One group of people had genetics to present day South Asia, while the other group related to the people of Central Europe. And finally, a group particularly from the Greek island of Crete. But how? All here? They found the bones and deaths were genetically separated in time by as much as a thousand years difference. Wooden artifacts, iron spearheads, even slippers and jewelry were found by the National Geographic team who studied 30 skeletons in 2003. Skin still on some of them. Oof. 300 people have been found so far. Legend goes, Parvati, a supreme goddess, cursed the kingdom, unleashing drought and disaster upon them. She sent down a blizzard of hail and whirlwind which swept the people into the lake. Their skeletons are a warning to those who disrespect the goddess. I mean, maybe. The skeletons are visible in the clear water of the shallow lake during one month when the ice melts. That's terrifying. I'm gonna chicken out right now and just never visit this place. Just show up and get Jack Skellington? Are you kidding me? No way, dude. And number one, the city of screams. Top of my relaxing trip list, Golgala City, Afghanistan. Peaceful once as it was the capital of the Gorid people until Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire seized it in about the 12th century. Apparently legend goes its ruler, Jalaladin Mangburnu, fought back and apparently killed Khan's grandson in battle. Yeah, probably not a good idea. In 1221, Khan sent his 15 year old Mudu Khan here to claim and siege who in turn, was shot and killed with an arrow, precipitating the siege of Bam Yan. At first, the city held strong, but was apparently sold out by the ruler's daughter, who, according to legend, betrayed the castle's secret entrance, sharing and consorting with the enemy. Expecting to be rewarded, her and her people were unfortunately slaughtered. And the ruins, cursed, of course. And the ruins, Cursed, of course. The Russians, the Taliban, and the Americans have all used these ruins as fighting posts over the years, as this place hasn't been lived in since. But through them is apparently very haunted, the ruins subject to those who still hear the screams of the fallen. Yeah, terrifying. Haunting sounds of screaming and warfare are echoed here, thus giving it its famous name of the City of Screams. Dark horseback figures to even full on uniform specters are seen atop the rubble. Yeah, I just say we just avoid this place completely and just kinda back away slowly out of respect, you know? In fifth, we have the Most Holy Trinity Church in New York, built sometime between 1882 and 1885 on land that previously served as a graveyard until 1853. According to local rumors, not all of the bodies residing there were exhumed from the graveyard, and the spirits of those left behind still inhabit the grounds to this day. The church property covers an entire city block, and it is said that there are false closets leading to bricked up doorways, tunnels, and random sub 
of basements throughout the church and convent. There are also mysterious passageways on the upper levels of the church, where legend says only priests are able to enter. The church's rectory was built in 1872 by its second pastor, Monsignor Michael May, who later passed in his room on the second floor. Priests who live in the rectory have used that space for mainly a guest room ever since, as no one has ever been willing to live in it on an ongoing basis. Guests have experienced lights being switched off and on, hearing strange noises, and the sound of a person walking back and forth while trying to sleep. Phantom footsteps have also been heard on the staircases in the building, and dogs who were once kept as pets in the rectory would stare in a trance light stake down the basement stairs, as well as into the dining room when the building got cold. In 1897, a parish bell ringer named George Stell's life was taken in the vestibule of the church. Though there was a suspect in the case, a former parishioner who would later be executed for an unrelated ending of life, no one was ever convicted of the crime. The red fluids of Mr. Stell's, as well as the red handprint of the killer, is believed to still be on the wall in a stairway leading to the bell tower. George's ghost still roams the church and is believed to be the reason why the bells will ring suddenly, vowing not to leave until his death has been solved. Moving on to our fourth place position, we have the Aquia Church of Stafford, Virginia. While the congregation was established in 1711, the physical parish wasn't built until 1751. It was a gorgeous brick building built on a peaceful hilltop with a two-story crucifix floor plan, which otherwise known as a cruciform, which was considered a rather unusual style for colonial churches. Aquia was built to replace two earlier sites of the Overwharton Parish, which were constructed around 1680. The inside of the church burned down in 1754 and was not rebuilt until 1757. It was then shut down from the Revolutionary War until the Civil War due to lack of funding before reopening as a stable, campsite, and hospital for Union forces. It was during this closure that a young blonde woman was traveling the dark country roads, rural Stafford County, when a group of highwaymen accosted her. This time period was full of exasperated uncertainty from the war, and with it a severe lack of resources, food, and money. Men would wait hidden on the side of roads to steal the valuables from people walking or riding by their hiding spots. She ran from the men to the sanctuary of the church, but was only able to hide for a little while before they broke inside and ended her life. Her body was hidden in the tower, and the men were never caught. It wasn't until after the Revolutionary War ended in 1775, and the church was ready to reopen for services, that what was left of her was discovered. A skeleton with golden blonde hair that was as intact as if she had been freshly slain. The red fluid that spilled on the floor from her death was impossible to remove. Despite using every trick known to man, the stains remained in the tower for well over a hundred years, until during a modern renovation when the redness was covered up by concrete. With the facility still being in use today, members of the church have mentioned hearing footsteps walking around at all hours of the day and will break into a frantic run around the church at night, but no one is there. Noises can be heard in the empty tower, with some saying it sounds like a struggle, others describing a groan, whistle, or even a call for help. Many have also mentioned seeing a transparent woman in the church's windows, on the balcony, or even in the graveyard, dubbing her Blonde Beth after the hair of the skeleton. In the 1900s, brave people would try to stay overnight at the church, but were chased away by what they described as an unfriendly presence. A custodian working in the graveyard saw a ghostly woman's face floating above the graves, while another man saw a woman smiling at him through the balcony windows before she vanished. In the middle of this creepy sandwich, in third place, we're taking a closer look at St. Mary the Virgin, located on the outskirts of Clop Hill, England. Originally built facing the west sometime around the year 1350, it's believed to have been erected on top of a leper hospital run by monks. I'd like to take a moment to note that it was built in the quote-unquote wrong direction, with churches traditionally facing east, the direction from which the sun rises, which is associated with the location of heaven and the return of the Messiah in Christian religion. Altars inside of these holy buildings would face in the eastbound direction for prayers. Some have claimed that because St. Mary the Virgin faces away from God, it thus opens its doors to hell, and ergo responsible for the tale I'm about to tell. The building was abandoned in 1848, when the rector at the time made the decision to have a new church built, instead of expanding the previous one, which was much needed due to the rapidly growing congregation. Old St. Mary's, as was dubbed by the locals, was then primarily used as a mortuary chapel, holding bodies before they were buried in the adjacent cemetery. By the 1950s, St. Mary's had become so run down that it could no longer fulfill that use, with just the outdoor walls and tower remaining. 
In March 1963, the tomb of an 18th century apothecary's wife was broken into, and the bones were arranged ritualistically in the middle of the church. And once again on Midsummer's Eve of 1969, multiple women's graves were broken into, with bones being removed and rearranged once more. While the specific individuals involved in these acts were never identified, the arrangements found resembled those used in black mass rituals performed by satanic groups at the time. After the first incident in 1963, a rare decision was made to rehollow, or in more simple terms, re-bless the altar that was left in the building, in a failed attempt to protect the building from evil. Later that year, Reverend Harold Coulthurst reported stumbling upon a group of men in the building that were in the midst of a mysterious ritual, being quoted as saying that the men were trying to communicate with evil spirits, chanting some sort of mumbo jumbo. They were definitely in league with the devil. Modern day visitors to the now landmark have reported seeing a plethora of ghostly figures during the day and nighttime, faint lights moving about before vanishing mysteriously, along with reports of a chilly and oppressive atmosphere even during warm days. In second place, we're visiting L'Abbé de Mortemer, or Mortimer Abbey. It was originally built in 1134 on land gifted by King Henry I. The stagnant water of the drainage lake, which was dug out by the monks to dry up the marshy land, was called Mortemer, or the dead pond, giving the monastery its name. Totally not ominous or anything. The monks constructed what was then one of the largest monasteries in the world on said land. The legend says that after the passing of his only son, King Henry wanted to reform his daughter Matilda and had her locked in a room in the abbey for five years. The anger and hate she felt from being sent away and isolated stained and seeped into the walls of the monastery, cursing it for eternity. After her eventual release, she went on to live until 1167, when it said her spirit returned to Mortimer Abbey to haunt the area as the White Lady. She is said to appear on nights close to a full moon, moaning as she drifts through the now ruins of the monastery. Those that have seen her report that she alternates between wearing black and white gloves. If she appears to you with white gloves on, you're destined for good luck. But if she appears with black, you'll be expected to pass within a year. Alas, Matilda is not the only spirit one must worry about if visiting the abbey. When the monastery was at its peak in the 1500s, a frail and suffering woman was brought to the monks with an illness it was believed that only they could aid. It was revealed that she was possessed by the spirit of a wolf and cursed to become a werewolf for several nights. The monks chained her to a room and conducted multiple exorcisms in an attempt to eradicate the spirit. The monks were able to exorcise the evil wolf spirit or demonic force out of the woman, but it then attached itself to the grounds and walls of the monastery. Several hundred years later in 1884, a man named Roger Sabaro was hunting in the woods nearby when he was attacked by a large werewolf. He shot it multiple times, killing the creature, but when he returned home at dawn, he found the body of his wife bearing wounds matching those he had given the wolf. People say the spirit of Roger's wife and his own heartbroken spirit still wander the area when the moon is full. The abbey was exorcised by the church in 1921, but still remains haunted to this day. And coming in first place, we have the Abbey of the Black Hag, locally known as Monastern Gallagduff, please don't curse me for my pronunciation, St. Catherine's Abbey, or simply as Old Abbey. It's located roughly two miles east of the village of Shanna Golden in the townland of Old Abbey. Gee, can you tell where it got its name? <laughs> One of the earliest recorded nunneries in Ireland, with its first official record being around 1298, it was built on land donated by John Fitzthomas and has the typical layout for abbeys of its time, with a dining hall, cells, isolated meditation areas, and other rooms still able to be identified amongst the runes today. During the 15th century, there was a major battle for supremacy in the area between the Earl Fitzgerald and the prestigious Butler family, of which the Earldom of Ormond belonged. It got to such an extent that the local bishop was known to pray for peace between the families at masses. During one of the nightly attacks, Earl Fitzgerald attempted to get his wife to safety, but as he was pulling her onto his horse, an arrow pierced her thigh, shattering the bone and spraying red bodily fluids. As he rode on, the Countess appeared to have succumbed to her injury, leading the Earl to seek sanctuary at St. Catharines. The heartbroken man was certain his wife had passed, so he swiftly buried her between so he swiftly buried her beneath the altar and continued elsewhere to find safety. As the night went on, the nuns and residents began to hear hair-raising screams and made the decision to rebury the Countess in hopes of bringing her peace. When they dug up the body, they discovered her fingers were broken and her nails had been torn off. The poor woman had been buried alive with a very slow and torturous end of her life. To this day, it is believed that the Countess has been unable to find peace and continues to scream in anguish, waiting for her husband to save her from a fate truly worse than death. 
Moving slightly ahead in time, we come to the Black Nun herself. Described as one in the order that wasn't content with being humble, helping others over herself, and the servitude to God, she instead craved power. The Hag had her own cell, where she worshipped Satan and performed black magic, becoming a slave to the occult. This was the highest form of blasphemy in the church, and the other nuns in the order fled the abbey while the hag remained in her now house of darkness. To complete her rituals, the black nun would venture into the local community and perform depraved lewd acts and offer sacrifices, with bones of young community members later discovered on the grounds. In modern times, visitors have reported seeing the dark shadowy figure of a nun wandering, the feeling of being constantly watched, and a disembodied hand reaching towards them. It has been reported that flashlights cannot function in the nun's cell and modern batteries drain too quickly to have any sort of rational explanation.